off with uh, letting everyone know that we did convene uh, earlier this evening, starting at 515, to um, interview candidates for our Parks and Community Services Commission. So we are technically convening our regular meeting right now, and I'll start that with a roll call, please. Thank you. Councilmember Hall. Here. Councilmember Moeller. Here. Councilmember Dornbecker. Here. Vice Mayor Chilton. Here. Mayor Dunbar. Here. And just for folks that uh, are new to the, the meeting, we do have agendas printed out on the wall to your right if you need one, but we'll be moving forward paperlessly uh, uh, from here on out. So uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I'm going to move, up, move on to item six, closed session report. I believe we do not have a closed session report. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Uh, next up is adoption of tonight's agenda. Do we have any changes, or is there a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? I move. Move to adopt the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Next up, we have public comment. So now is the opportunity for anyone that wants to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda to do so. But if you're here for an item that's already listed, we'll be getting to that uh, in short order. So. I'm guessing that's where we're at. All right. We'll move right on then to the consent calendar. We have two items on the consent calendar. Is there action to be had? I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes also. I did want to just recognize item 9B, the Napa County Veterans Advocacy Coalition, and thank the um, supervisor, Wagon Connect, also Alman Bundy, Michael Bunch, and there was a fourth gentleman here. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, Lucerne, Lucerne. Frank. Frank Lucerne. Oh, Frank, yeah. Lucerne. I believe um, there was another individual. Thank all of them for um, bringing this forward and letting everyone know that we do have uh, services that have been consolidated and available to uh, veterans that the county is offering. This coalition is really doing a nice job to uh, get that information in the right hands. So just wanted to recognize that. We're going to move on to presentations. The first one, a presentation of a proclamation acknowledging March as American Red Cross Month. So welcome, representatives of the American Red Cross. And I'm going to come down and read this proclamation. I believe we do have Francis Hauser here this evening as the chapter chairperson. Uh, I will be presenting that to you, so come on down. You're welcome to do that. So I'm going to read this proclamation that is declaring March as American Red Cross Month. Whereas each March, the American Red Cross and its local community chapters are formally recognized for their essential humanitarian role in the cities and counties they serve. And whereas every day, Napa County Red Cross volunteers and employees provide essential services in our community to help those affected by everything from house or apartment fires to floods, earthquakes, and other natural and human-caused disasters, thanks to the generous people through, throughout Napa County, the chapter's only source of financial support. And whereas for more than 95 years, the citizens of all these cities and town in Napa County have relied on the Red Cross to provide disaster relief, as well as training in life-saving skills and disaster response processes and procedures. Whereas over the past year, the Napa County Red Cross Disaster Action Team, volunteers who are on call 24-7, 365 days a year, responded to six local residential fires and helped 29 displaced people with emergency food, clothing, and a warm, dry bed to sleep in. Whereas over the past year, 1,566 individuals learned life-saving and safety skills, including first aid, CPR, and AED training, 
and swimming and lifeguarding through 261 classes offered by the chapter. And whereas the Operation Military Support Committee of the Napa chapter has established a networking group of organizations and involved citizens for the purpose of ensuring that our veterans and military families are aware of and receive the benefits and support they are entitled to from federal, state, and local resources. And whereas the OMS committee also collected, sorted, and distributed over 1,500 holiday cards to the veterans home and residents at the pathway home. And whereas the Napa chapter offers a nursing assistant certification program at the veterans home in Yountville using the American Red Cross curriculum providing an opportunity for qualified participants to work in a rewarding career, and whereas the chapter conducted over 100 disaster education presentations for the community to help attendees learn to prepare to make their families and neighborhoods safer, and whereas Red Cross volunteers contributed thousands of hours of service to those impacted by Superstorm Sandy and to those at home in the Napa chapter serving as members of the Board of Directors, chapter committees, instructors teaching life-saving skills, office helpers, fundraising support, DAT responders to large and small disasters, and more. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, John F. Dunbar, Mayor of the Town of Yountville, do hereby proclaim March 2013 as American Red Cross Month, especially during this extraordinary time for our country we encourage all citizens to support the Napa County Chapter of the American Red Cross and its noble humanitarian mission. So, If you'd like to uh, Very say briefly, a few words, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. That was a lot of whereases. Um, it doesn't leave me very much to tell you about Red Cross. I think it's all covered, but a couple of very quick updates. Because we talk about one Red Cross, Red Cross is an organization of people helping people. We also work from community to community. And an update is last night, a group of five of us from Napa went up to Ukiah to respond to a multifamily fire up there. Fifty people were housed in the Ukiah High School yesterday, and last night there were 29 when we did the census count at 11 o'clock. So we are helping them, and if something big happens here, they'll be coming to help us because it's all one Red Cross. I have Mary Jean McLaughlin, Emeritus Board Chair, with me tonight. And again, on behalf of the board, the staff, and the volunteers of Napa County Red Cross, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank all of you for all the service you give our community and, and all the uh, Napa County communities and beyond, as you said. So thank you very much. Our next presentation is a presentation of our Parks and Recreation Annual Report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It is my pleasure to bring you our 2012 annual report. Um, as you recall, we started this format last year uh, to give you an update on how the annual year went. And um, I will go through the report just highlighting a couple of things and uh, not reading the whole thing for you, as I'm sure you can do that yourselves. And then I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So in 2012, uh, our department had full five full-time staff, and uh, we employed 45 part-time and seasonal staff. And we also couldn't do without our volunteers, which during the course of the year, we had 65 volunteers that came through with our events, sports leagues, and during special programs. We also had 17 partner agencies that we worked with last year to provide programs, and we had 175 generous sponsors that provided support to us throughout the year. <clears throat> so going to the next one, um, we have it broken out into several sections. The first one is the recreational programming. Um, in 2012, we outlined our objectives there in the blue, and I'll, like I said, just highlight a few of those for you. So we had a goal to increase offerings through partnerships with the Napa County Library. 
and just to highlight that, we offered a two special speaker series this year with uh, the library. The first one was pretty um, low in attendance, which was 15, but the second we had over 60 people in attendance, and that was talking about the history of the veterans home. So that was a great partnership that we had with the library, and we continue um, having that on our list of objectives for this year. Um, we also wanted to offer a comprehensive sponsorship package for our movie nights and other events. Um, we began doing that with this year's, or excuse me, 2012 um, Chili Cook-Off and Yontville Days weekend as a whole. And we've continued that just recently, mailed out sponsorship packages for our movie night series. And I'm excited to say that in less than a week, we've already gotten about $1,500 in sponsorships, which is very exciting for us. There was a little screaming in the office today. We got a big check. <laughs> Um, so going on to the next page, um, just a recap of the year for the recreational programs, which comprises all of our classes, sports excursions, our after school program and our, and our summer camps. Um, we served 38,114 people, which was up from 2011. Our revenue by calendar year. Um, is obviously up over 2000 from 2011 to 112,000 almost 13 and um, the revenue broken down by calendar year you can see that we have seen a lot of growth in our recreational classes sports and excursions um, most of that in classes and excursions and then some um, growth as well in our after school program under the new model that we've been providing and also in our summer camps uh, so over 2012, we've served um, 5,000 people more than in 2011, and our revenue increased by over $55,000. Um, I'm excited to announce that we're in the midst of implementing our new recreation software system. So that's very excited coming forward, and it'll go live towards the end of this month and then completely live with summer registration. So we look forward to um, having that as a tool to streamline some of this reporting for you as well. So on the next page is the community center facilities mission and um, information. And just to highlight there, um, one of our objectives was to analyze marketing tools and trends to reach um, our other target markets that we might not be serving. So we're in the process, we gathered information and were um, some different kinds of um, examples of how we would like to try to upgrade our rental brochures and packages uh, and we are working on developing those in-house over the next couple months to get them printed in the next budget cycle um, we also talked about evaluating rental fees and we did that again which will come forward to you in the next couple council meetings with our fee and charges um, so you'll see those um, we wanted to work on building our midweek rental base, and we're continuing to work with our hotels, nonprofits, and other groups um, to fill those midweeks, uh, avail the availability that we do have with seminars and meetings, which we are uh, seeing growth there. So in comparison, um, we've had 54 new bookings last year, 127 rentals, and our revenue was up. Um, and we provided 44 fee waived and sponsorship events. Um, so if you just look at the community center usage, uh, we had 38,114 come through in our classes and events, and there's an extra nine in the next number to update that. And, an ex and another 18,000 plus come through in our private events, so during rentals and other types of fundraising events. So on the next page, we outlined um, how many or the different organizations that we offered a co-sponsorship uh, or partial fee waiver. Um, many of them, most of them are local organizations and then also some of our partner agencies like the City of Napa Recycling Division, they come up and offer composting classes um, or UC Master Gardeners, which um, offers classes for us as well in exchange for meeting space. <clears throat> So that 44 events that were co-sponsored or issued fee waivers in 2012 would have a market worth of over $66,000 in sponsorship. Pretty impressive there. Um, so overall, we're seeing positive trending at the community center. Our rentals have increased. Um, and just to highlight, one of our areas that we really wanted to put a lot of emphasis on was that midweek, mid -week, midday. Um, and we've seen a 35% increase in that um, from 2011 to 12. So it is uh, working. 
So the next page is the pool. And um, in 2012, we wanted to start offering private swim lessons on Saturday mornings. We started that last summer. It was very successful. We served 77 children in those private swim lessons. And I covered that in our summer report as well. But um, quite a few of those were special needs kids who wouldn't have otherwise been able to take swimming lessons with us because a group lesson is not the right environment for them. So um, it was a great learning experience for us and our staff and a great um, service to those families. Um, we also had a goal of developing and implementing an outreach program to try to build our numbers for the veterans home members. Um, we held a preseason opener for the veterans home. We had 75 people attend that, um, more than had RSVP'd. <laughs> we were down to the last hot dog, um, but it was so amazing to have such a good turnout. Um, so in 2012, we did see an increase in our utilization of open swim times. Um, but as you remember, in 2011, we had to close early because of that water main break. So that's a little bit of that. Um, we did see a little bit of growth in our swimming lessons. Um, family swim passes were down slightly. We did increase fees last year, so that might have been part of that um, decline. But we hope to see that come back as well as the couples passes and then our junior guard program. Um, we just had a hard time having an instructor for more than one session, so that number was down as well. So pool revenue um, had a slight decrease last summer, um, under $800, mainly due to the junior guard program and a little bit of the pass um, money being down. So under the next um, heading, department marketing, and um, as you recall, we brought our department marketing plan for, to the council to approve in July. And staff is in the process of implementing those elements. Um, we've started in August and we continue going through and implementing those. And you'll see some of those changes um, in our upcoming recreation guide as well. It'll be out in a few weeks. Um, the next heading is the Park and Special Events Administration. Uh, so. We wanted to update our reservation forms and we achieved that. Um, we also now have forms that uh, customers can actually type into and sign live online and email to us right from there. So they don't have to print them anymore and then scan or fax them over. We're also working with the Public Works Department to look at um, additional areas of expansion and the costs that would be associated with that, uh, mainly the north end of Veterans Park. Uh, so in 2012, we did see an overall increase in our park rentals and increase in revenue. Uh, we had 43 rentals and 20, or we saw an increase of 43 rentals total and about $3,000 in revenue. Um, our department also processed 28 special event sound and banner permits last year. And those events range from small gatherings that are more than 250 people to bike events that come through Yauntville that are over 3,000. Um, so each permit's carefully <coughs> reviewed. Um, we take them in through our department and send them out to all the other different departments to take a look at and give feedback. And we schedule meetings with the event holders and um, we put together all of the requirements that everyone has. So 28 of those last year. So it was a very busy year for our department. Um, we continue to serve more people each year, and I think we continue to provide a higher quality of programming um, than the year before. And we will be sending out our annual survey in the next about six weeks. Um, we'll do that every year, always trying to get more. I think we quadrupled our numbers last year, so <laughs> maybe we'll have you uh, quadruple it again this year. Um, but we're really looking forward. We're really focused on that software implementation. It's going to really streamline things for us and open up hopefully more time for staff to be creative. Um, so that concludes my report, and I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Questions about the report? Councilmember Hall? First of all, thank you for the report. I mean, this is a consistent report that we've seen now a couple years in a row, and the information and the data that we get from it, I think, tells us a lot more about how we're reaching our community. Just a couple of observations, and they're observations, so you guys can just check me on this. But um, you know, I, I went back through as you were <clears throat> as you were talking, and I said, well, let's look at the volume of the people and the revenue increase that we saw. And is it really that we're seeing an increase in the number of people, or an increase in the amount of what we're charging, which is kind of what this council um, intimated? a year, well, in the last year or so, 
Um, and, and we're seeing both, the effect of both of that, and, and that's really remarkable. Um, you, know, you go from 32,000 to 38,000, I guess, participants in the programs. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal that we're getting that, that much more activity. Um, but then you couple that with uh, actually a relative price increase where you see about 16% on a relative unit price increase. And that we were able to grow the volume of people and increase the price to 16% is that's remarkable. And I think that's probably a testament to the fact that we're getting better with the information. We're getting better with the message and the marketing of the program, and, and that's due to, to what you've done here. I did have just a couple of, of what I thought was maybe uh, an oversight, but it's only because I was participatory. <clears throat> that's the new iPad technology uh, falling apart. Um, and my only, one of, the, one of the observations, and maybe I'm wrong in this, but um, the town, I believe, supported at least partially the Texas Hold'em tournament. And I didn't see that in the list. Is that incorrect in my understanding? Because I was participatory in that. It's possible that we missed something. Oh, it's a, that was the big one, though, because it was such a... That, that would be actually a, a sponsorship with the Outville School Foundation. So. so we listed it. It is counted in the number, but I didn't actually pull out the Outville School Foundation as a bullet, and I will update that. Well, I just reference. thought that was an interesting one, only because I was intimately involved with that activity, but I just wanted to make note of... <laughs> make note of that thank you richard <laughs> you asked us to read it so I'm no i appreciate it i missed a bullet question about the uh on the pool you make a comment about providing healthier snack hoises or choices yes. and the question i have with that is was it successful is it not i mean is this driving are kids not buying food from the snack bar or do you know kids are buying food from the snack bar but unfortunately, they don't choose the healthy option. So that doesn't mean we're not still providing that option. Um, it's hard to stock fresh fruit. We tried, and we have a lot of waste, and it's, it's very expensive. So we're looking at different ways, whether it's dried fruit packages or um, setting some different standards <coughs> as to the level of sugar in an item that we will offer versus not. I mean, they'll eat what we have basically is what we're finding. But if there's a choice between an apple and a Hot Pocket, they're going to go for the Hot Pocket. (laughs) So we're working at, you know, looking at some different levels as to what we will even provide there. But, um, you know, we we did bring in some yogurt. We learned that freezing Go-Gurts was popular. So we were working on that. Um, You know, we've, we're, trail mix different things like that so good this is actually a slow a, transition a, a good segue with the fact that sometimes we have competing goals and objectives and i say that because the business manager side of the town manager role likes to maximize the profit that the snack bar gives us as an opportunity let's be clear so it's minimizing the subsidy <clears throat> well yes minimizing correct but in this case <laughs> maximizing the revenue that the snack bar offers us Um, because to your point we still have a seventy thousand dollar subsidy but the net effect is the healthy options has been a less profitable revenue source so when we look at that but i also think it's important that that's not the only consideration that the town has we are taking our role our commitment to be a heel city and look at changing some of our principles and sometimes that does mean it comes with a secondary price and that's the only footnote that i'm saying is a healthier snack bar is the right thing to do even though it's not positive in our revenue stream i just have a couple more quick observations and i apologize if i'm being verbose the um thanks no comment um just with regards to the pool revenue specifically the 2012 season was flat year over year or slightly down, but you had additional, what appears to be additional swim times, and your comment was that it was due to the junior guard program being down by nine. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, you guys will look at that. I, I think it's probably, there's probably something else. Maybe the prices were, I don't know why it's down, but that doesn't seem consistent based on the fact that you were up almost 10% on the open swim times, and I'm assuming those are participants. But just it's an observation more than anything mm-hmm. else. And then my last observation, um, <clears throat> and this is maybe for Kathleen or whoever's compiling the data for the report, um, the data in trend is outstanding, and that really helps a lot. What might also be additionally useful for um, the council, 
and maybe more so I don't have to do the math myself, is if you could unitize. <clears throat> so if you have 38,000 events, you can generate $212,000 in revenue. Tell me what the unit per revenue was. How much was each one? I came up with like $5.60 versus the prior year, which was $4.80. So I know you got a 16% revenue per unit increase. That's where I'm going to come back and tell you, I know your price increases are affecting it, and your volume obviously wasn't negative. So it's a rate volume issue. It's an old insurance gimmick, but it actually does tell you something. I can so definitely add that in. If you don't future. mind, I ask sure. just as an observation. I think it's a great report, and I think it's wonderful direction for the town, and I'm, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any other questions about the report? I did Council have just Dornbecker. a couple. Um, one is um, in the um, recreational programming goals, the the, um, the new sponsorship packages. Can you tell me what kind of businesses are those going out to, Samantha? They went out to pretty much every business within Yauntville and then some of our who have been sponsors and for our other events as well, um, the Yauntville Appalachian. And then also, you know, we serve a lot of uh, Napa kids here in Yauntville in our programs. And I think that some of the more uh, youth-centric businesses in Napa, um, one of our the big sponsors that came in today that resulted in the screaming was um, a local orthodontist who serves a lot of children and saw the value in what we were going to provide. So... Um, Basically, yeah. I mean, we it's the first time we've really done a broad broadcast for those sponsorships. So, you know, the packages do offer some rewards in return, and hopefully Lewis got his in the mail and probably Richard. Um, but <laughs> I think that, plug. you know, we're going to give it a try and see. The only other thing that caught my eye that I thought was pretty stunning was the, um, the number of... Um, uh, teens program uh, now I can't find it it was 800 to like 20. Yeah, yeah 866 down to 23 yeah that's tough that's hard so we we have adjusted down last year in the budget cycle when we were talking about cost recovery the team program um, I, I don't know if you guys recall, but we brought you a couple different options because that program was very difficult to sustain, the after-school program. Um, we are working uh, with Denning, who you saw earlier this evening, who is our teen representative on the commission, and going to be offering, on actually on June 11th, a teen roundtable to try to solicit some more information. Um, but you will see a proposal coming back to you with the budget to add back some different kinds of team programming. It will not be the structured after-school program um, or the summer camp. So what you really saw was the lack of those two programs. So when you add up um, the two to three drop-in kids a day for the school year and the six to t you know 10 kids a week for the summer camp, it added up. Um, but it, unfortunately, the cost to service was just too high. Um, but you will see some proposals coming back to you for team programming. I thought he had some very good ideas. And, Definitely. You know, I yeah. think a video game uh, um, contest thing would be very popular, I think. Yeah, so we're looking at how to, how to provide some of those services um, on it. A more of a drop-in, you know, once or once, twice a month special activity, I think, is what we're leaning towards. But we look forward to getting that information from the focus group. Then I have one uh, general question, not to Samantha, but in general. In the past, when we, before we went paperless, we used to have all of the um, agenda items available to look at. And I was wondering if we are planning to instead project them instead of uh, so that those who do attend our meetings can see what we're talking about. We haven't thought of projecting them actually, but we do have a binder here with all of the oh, agenda see. items of any member of the public would like to refer to them. They are here and they are available on our website um, if they were to look those up. I see. And if they want to know what's going on, they can also sign up for our e-notifier program. And then if there's a topic that they're interested in, they could go to our website to view that as well. <coughs> but in some presentations, we will still see them on the screen as well. The, the subject matter, but we can look at other options in presenting that. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor. 
I think my only question, I was looking at page five, which has sort of the total number of participants, um, had to do with, you talked about your, your software. Is Do you have any feel of, you know, of 3,000 residents of town, how many actual individuals participated? When we look at youth programs, say there was 13,000 participants. Mm-hmm. Well, my kids count for 180 days of school, maybe 360 of those, <laughs> my two. So it's not as if there are 13,000 different kids. Right. It's attendance at a... It's actually enrollment. So like, uh, for instance, your kids would count only twice for okay. after school during the course of a year. Enrollment um, in a certain kind of event or yeah. program. And so, and also part of that number is attendance at special events. So that obviously is a large number. Um, but the nice thing is, is with the recreation software is it will be able to report um, data in so many different ways. So one of them would be we serve this many individual customers this year okay. um, versus, att- you know, and we can show you single attendances, um, enrollments. It can be pretty diverse, the, the amount of information that can come out of it. So, okay. So very, that very youth excited. programs with 13,700 is a much bigger number than even I was thinking. Yeah. If you're looking at single day attendances, it's yeah. much larger. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to the page seven uh, bullet list also and just ask a couple of questions um, yes, if these events qualify or if they're already included. The first one was the um, Tug McGraw Foundation uh, um, Halloween Fun Run. If we were partners in that, I thought we were. We were. Maybe not. Uh, that would just be another <coughs> um, organization to include. Now, the Alzheimer's Association conference that has been held here a couple of years now, does that fall under the Commission on Aging, or would that be a separate call out? Do you know? Uh, we partner with them. Um, it would be. They come in as a partner, but we also offer, we do somewhat of an exchange with them. They come in and do some other uh, seminars for us as more of a class or. Okay, so option. again, just to remind you in case it's something that you want to consider to add, because I think it's a. It's a very impressive, robust list, and not only do we not want to leave out anyone that's been intimately involved in any of the events, but uh, just to remind folks how much we really are offering and, and partnering with uh, the community to provide a wide variety of, of opportunities. The last one, just our, our wellness fair, uh, if we would qualify that with the uh, Queen of the Valley, uh, St. Joseph's Medical Center, or... You see is that it, as a, um, it's, we show it as one of our events. Okay. So it's a, we, I, I categorize it as a town event. Okay. That's fine then. Um, I'll echo the council's uh, appreciation for the thoroughness and also the entire staff's uh, continued great, great work to serve the community. So thank you very much. Thank I you. invite anybody from the public who'd like to comment on our recreation um, uh, annual report, park and rec annual report, if you'd like. No, your your chance is coming at, coming up soon here. Um, great. Well, then again, Samantha, thank you very much, and thanks to uh, your entire team. Um, thank we you. We have a lot and of I'll folks that, that make this all sure. happen. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to click back a few here <coughs> to our uh, one public hearing for tonight, item 11 in, on the agenda: Cornerstone Cellars, a use permit amendment, uh, considering. Approving a use permit, let's see, okay. uh, to allow Cornerstone to expand its use into the second floor office space previously occupied by Coldwell Banker and consisting of a meeting and conference room space and a VIP private tasting room. And I think there are a couple of disclosures. Councilmember Hall. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I've consulted with the town attorney and have been advised that while the discussion on wine tasting room regulations within the town of Yauntville have no direct impact upon the operations of my employer, Cliff Lady Vineyards, to the extent that there may be indirect impacts upon my employer, these economic impacts are not significant enough under the regulations of the FPPC to result in my disqualification. At this time, I would like to participate, but I'm required to disclose that I'm a employee of Cliff Lady Vineyards serving as its chief financial officer. Thank you. And I'll just uh, mention that I did have a conversation with the applicant um, just to uh, let me know that he was going to be coming forward with this request and uh, was looking to have this uh, meeting room and uh, additional tasting room space. So I'll be learning about the details of that um, tonight along with everyone else. Vice Mayor. 
I have not uh, iPadded my uh, standard disclosure like, like Councilmember Hall did. Thank you. But uh, I did, uh, I believe it was a year and a half ago, had a letter to the FPPC regarding not only restaurants but tasting rooms. Uh, and my business is 500 feet within this business, um, but there's not any material impact <clears throat> on my business, so I will participate in this discussion. Okay. I think that's it. We can move ahead with the staff report. Good evening. Tonight you have before you a request by Cornerstone Cellars to expand its use into the second floor office space that was previously occupied by Coldwell Banker. And these photographs show the space. It's the stairway up to the second floor landing. Uh, the next one is the landing, and the next two are photos of the interior of the space. And it's a small space, approximately 330 square feet. And the applicant has several proposed mixed uses for the space, the primary component of which is as office space to support the cor Cornerstone seller's use. Um, and it will meet Cornerstone's needs as a meeting and conference room sp space in a private environment where Cornerstone can meet with distributors, the press, and conduct um, other office and business meetings. The applicant indicates that the downstairs tasting room is not effective to serve this purpose, that it's a public tasting room, that the one private space, the VIP tasting room, is often its use, in use, and when it isn't, it serves as an access way to the storage areas for stemware and other items that support the tasting room use. So the proposed second floor office space is a private space that will suit this need that they don't currently have. And if this were the only component of the use before you tonight, it would be approved at staff level. It's an office use, and we support office uses. But since this office use will be occasional, it's not a daily use, the applicant has um, other ideas for the use of the space, one of which is a VIP tasting room. And this would be a space for approximately 6 to 15 guests. The applicant would advertise to its wine club members um, via um, email notifications to them, and the downstairs tasting room is quite popular, so the second floor tasting room um, has that potential and it could be used frequently. Um, the second floor tasting room represents an intensification of the office use, and it's an expansion of the tasting room activity, activity into a space that previously wasn't used for tasting. Um, the room itself, however, and the whistle stop center as a whole um, are very likely able to accommodate this use. One of the issues is parking, and the commercial retail use has a higher parking standard than the office use, but when it's applied to this 300 square foot space, it slightly increases the standard but doesn't require an additional stall. Um, the hours of the VIP tasting room would be the same as the downstairs tasting room from 10 to 7, and no new employees are required for the use. It's also a um, very small space, which limits the number of people that can occupy the space, and it will be limited by the table and chairs that are permanently set up in, in the area. The last use that the applicant would like to use for the space is for occasional special events, and the approved use permit allows 14 minor special events of up to 26 people, and the applicant proposes to conduct this use within these parameters. Um, so what we would see is a relocation of the approved use um, and simply a relocation rather than adding to the number of special events. Staff is proposing a condition of approval that the wine tasting room report the details of any and all special events to staff prior to holding the event, and this will allow staff to impose reasonable conditions of approval and also to monitor the number of special events that are being conducted over the year, which will be more effective um, for staff. Um, so we are proposing that condition, and we are supportive of the use, and we are recommending approval. The last item I want to comment on is the proposed sign. If we could go back a couple to show the existing yeah, it's sign. Kind of frozen up at the moment. <laughs> we saw um, it for two seconds. Yeah. <laughs> the sign is it's part of the attachment, right? I have it on report, my. So. I yeah. have it on my yeah. screen now. So the whistle stop center is subject to a master sign plan. Um, and all the businesses have approved signs under this plan. This proposed sign would replace the approved um, Coldwell, Coldwell Banker Bank. sign, and it's exactly the same in size and dimensions. It is consistent with the master sign plan. 
um, staff does want to comment on the copy on the sign and the tasting room element. Um, and staff reminds the council that the assigned ordinance allows businesses to have business identification signage. You can also have um, words that identify the goods sold or services offered where these are necessary to identify the business. And um, the question is whether those words are necessary. This is a second floor um, space that's primarily used for office. It is a private facility rather than being open to the public. And there may be it may lead to confusion that the public is invited to the second um, floor space. So staff thinks that's an item um, worthy of discussion, but otherwise the sign is completely in conformance with the master sign plan, and we're recommending approval of that as well. Very good. I'm trying to type my notes as I go here, getting used to that. Um, any questions about the staff board? Council Member Muller? Yeah, I, I have a question. It really relates to something that could occur in the future rather than, rather than this. So uh, currently uh, there is a conditional use permit where Cornerstone is right now. So if they were to ever leave and a new wine tasting room wanted to come in, that conditional use is established. Okay. Are we, would that, let's say Cornerstone moved out, Page moved out, and all three spaces were now available. Could theoretically three tasting rooms move into the three spaces. I know it's upstairs is very small, but I've seen small tasting rooms so that we would really be establishing uh, a conditional use by calling this a tasting room. I, I know it's mostly office space, but how would that set us up for the future? I think that would be a concern. We know that downstairs the primary use is a retail commercial use for wine tasting. Right. This is presented as primarily an office use with a component of wine tasting. So I think a wine tasting room that came in and wanted to be primarily wine tasting would not meet the intent of a resolution approved under this Okay, um, so this would still be really, um, we don't give conditional uses for office space, but this would still be designated office space. Yes. So someone could permitting a commercial tasting room activity, though. Uh, a private tasting room activity. Correct. Correct. Private. Not open to the public. Private. Yes. Good point. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions about the staff report? No. Um, one question I had that might come up um, <coughs> when the applicant speaks is um, ABC compliance, uh, and we've had this discussion about second floor outside the view of the primary location is it because they would have a dedicated server as part of that upstairs serving that that's why it qualifies i'll let the applicant respond to that but the basic use permit that um, the business operates under is required to be consistent with the rules and regulations of the abc so they'll need abc approval to use the space he may be able to talk more about the specifics of those rules and because there is a um um, what's the word, um, equal service downstairs, at least equal service downstairs. There's no trigger for ADA accessibility since the only way upstairs is the stairs. Correct. So that's not applicable. Right. Also being a private service area might not trigger that as well. Okay. Just want to check on that. Um, okay. I welcome the applicant to come forward and make your case. Okay. Uh, public hearing? My oh, yes. Yeah, so I'll formally, sorry, formally open the public hearing for protocol's sake. Thank uh, you. My name's uh, Craig Camp of Cornerstone Sellers. And uh, while direct-to-consumer sales is obviously very important to me, uh, half of my business is uh, direct-to-trade sales. So it's very important for me to have a conference room where I can make formal presentations and uh, do so in privacy without uh, uh, people coming through to clean the glasses and so forth. A uh, significant aspect of my business is export. So the ability to have a formal uh, tasting room for guests from other countries with a different culture uh, is very important to me. Um, at that said, uh, I, I'm a working winery, and uh, I hope to be able to use it not as an overflow aspect of my tasting room, but to use as a, as a private uh, event center for my wine club members or for, say, uh, some executives from... IBM, for instance, are having, uh, I want to come in for a tasting, if I could have a small event like that. But that is not the primary use of it, and it's, uh, 
Uh, I'm not interested in developing overflow or a public space that's not in my interest. Um, in fact, the reason you mentioned the sign, the reason I have the sign like that is not, in all honesty, to advertise the loft. <laughs> it's to, to have a north exposure uh, for my brand on the building, uh, as that's the higher traffic area of town. And it's been uh, a detriment, detriment to me, I think, in traffic flow that I've not been able to uh, expose uh, my brand in that direction. So I think it's a pretty a straightforward thing. We're putting in, a, I think, a very sophisticated audiovisual system uh, uh, because I think you know we have a lot of uh, strong visuals uh, that we want to, to share with people. Also, a very important aspect for me, of course, is media, being in the wine business and having a, a, a private uh, 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 meeting room in order to make these types of presentations to the press is very good for their egos <laughs> so so uh, uh, as you know we we are um, we rent the entire building we sublet one portion to page and then uh, this section is a completely different lease with the with the landlord uh, it certainly would not be uh, available as a uh, tasting room independently because of its it does not have uh, handicap access in, in any way so um, I think our, our use is pretty straightforward. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions of the applicant? Councilmember Hall. Hi. Thank you, and thanks uh, for sharing the information you did. One question I have with my experience, obviously, at a winery, you know, usually or there are often times when people will come in and they'll want to do a tasting and either the bar is full or um, there's an opportunity for a special, special tasting. I mean, is, there, is that something that – is always going to be directed that the VIP tasting room will only be used for VIP tastings when they're booked in advance, or what's the process by it, which people it, be? Yeah, it's only only for advance bookings. Uh, I don't have the staffing uh, because the my, our tasting room itself is not very large, right. so I don't. I would not have the staffing available to to take a person out of a out of the tasting room during a high volume period just to take a group upstairs without a prior reservation. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's it's just a. As you know, there's a lot of times people are always looking for the access. Right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we're in, I'm not real inclined to that type of activity anyway. Or, uh, you know, as we haven't had a lot of events and so forth uh, when we've been here, I find uh, that a little bit of alcohol may be good for sales, but a lot isn't. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, we, we tend to have very... Uh, earlier in the day activities uh, for our wine clubs and things like that that don't go outside of normal business hours. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess my only other question that I have for you, because I, you know, I, I saw the image of the sign and the material, and then just thinking about it on the side of the building, because I live on Mulberry Street, not, and I get what you're saying. This is, you know, this is another signage that you might be able to take advantage of. But the only confusion that I think it would present to customers are potentially – that up that stairwell is a tasting room. And, right. and, and I, you know, I guess my question for you as the applicant is, is the words tasting room on there, I mean, could it be modified to private tasting room? Or could it be, I mean, I guess my question really is ultimately, is it, without tasting room, does that become an issue for you? Well, my concern of putting, putting private tasting room on there, they might think my entire tasting room is private. Sure. So that I think would have a negative effect. Uh, um, I, you know, it's not it's not a generally accessible to the public area. It's not going to be open during the day when it's not in use. It's going to be my two year olds climb up those steps. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I say that in jest, so, but it's accessible mm -hmm. right. um, if you're there. Uh, right, but I, I mean, it's not it's not open. Uh, right, you know, it's going to be locked, and um, yeah, I I. I it's been, a, 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 I think, a bit of an issue for me and not having a northern exposure for our, our brand because so many people come in that direction. Yeah. Although we're adding some signage. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I do have a question. Oh, Vice Mayor? Go ahead. Sure. Well, my only question or follow-up is on the same topic. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if you want to have that on your sign, you can. Um, but... And I'm sure you've seen it in business. I've seen people do just crazy things that just defy all logic 
And I, I would say that my, my personal gut is you're going to have the issue of people coming and saying, I went up the stairs and nobody was there. What's happening? <laughs> well, yeah. And uh, I mean, I've had people move things out of the way and come <clears throat> through while we're doing, you know. So I, I would just say that's you. If that's okay. what you want, I'm okay with it. But I think you should think about that okay. of some way to identify that this is not where you enter I'll talk to first. my graphics person. And, see um, and I don't know what to say. But I think it will be an issue. Okay. I'm to touch on a different uh, topic that's on page two of the staff report. It has to do with, and you may or may not be able to answer this, and staff may be better to uh, answer at least part of this. It has to do with the um, language here about um, you're currently limited in the size of pourings and prohibited catering or prepared food items, and then it goes on to say that you would like flexibility to hold special events in the space, which may include winemaker dinners, uh, and these would be conducted under the current allocation of 14 minor special events that must be shared by Cornerstone and Page. So there are a couple components there. The food service mm -hmm. component, which we've been fairly uh, strict on about not having um, – food which becomes kind of a de facto restaurant experience uh, so if you could maybe describe a little bit more your thoughts there and then also how the 14 minor special events that are shared by you and Paige where are you with that sharing do you use all 14 does he use all 14 do neither of you use the total uh, how has that gone in the, the couple of years you've been there and I, I think maybe staff can help explain what the current restrictions are and what might be different in this application well I, I currently we're not using any I don't think we're, uh, um, we had uh, in our first year of business uh, we had uh, done uh, an event uh, for Premier Napa Valley and um, I didn't like the experience <laughs> of uh, um, uh, you know I, 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 I we're not there we're not a bar you know and uh, that's not the environment that I like so basically since then we haven't done anything um, as far as as winery di winemaker dinners we have uh, discussed uh, with uh, Bouchon in particular where they would uh, want to do some small events uh, for us and uh, Hurley's, and I'm sure uh, it's always been every event we've ever done where we've had any food at has always been done by a Yountville restaurant. So the concept you, you're proposing would be they'd bring in prepared food off-site like in a fairly typical catering situation and, and serve that food on-site because you don't have kitchen no, capacity. No, we, we, wouldn't have, we didn't even have any facility for that, So, uh, and I'm not interested in, in that. Um, uh, you know, we, we, being trying to compete with in the food business in Yountville is probably not really smart on my part. So I think I'll just let the the guys do it. So, okay. So I don't know if if you, Sandra, if you have any follow up to that question. Catered food and prepared foods are not allowed daily as part of the wine tasting, but they could be permitted at these special events, and they could be catering from Yountville restaurants. It could take it um, on any number of forms. Um, mm -hmm. And that would it's, fall it's under the, the flexibility that falls into the special events permit. Um, and those 14 are currently allowed on the site, and this would naturally extend to this additional space. Mm -hmm. You you would agree with that? It doesn't have to be a dinner. It could be downstairs a, a cocktail gathering. It could be could take any number of forms, but it does allow prepared food options that they're not permitted on a daily basis okay. for limited events. And they get the 14 minor, but they also have two or four major special events as well. Okay. Right. I, mean, I would see it more as a situation, for instance, if I had a, a journalist in, we may want to do a, a small little luncheon for them with, a, with wine. But, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a very small space. First of all, I don't think you could actually do any kind of significant event in there. I, the 12 people would be <coughs> packed. So, okay. it's, so it's really more of a, a for smaller groups for, like I said, presentations and maybe having a small lunch with it. Okay. So I'll, I'll ask again. Our staff, if would any food service on site trigger a special, a minor special event? Is that what you're saying? It would because it falls out the daily, falls outside of the terms of the daily use. Okay, so we would just need to monitor that if that mm -hmm. were to start occurring, even if it's a single person or 
eight people, whatever it might be, that that would need to just fall under the the conditions of of the special events. And if you're not really using them anyway, then that sounds Although like it's I think we look at that with some flexibility. If it's just one person coming in and it's a lunch that they're doing, that could be the same as bringing in your own lunch, essentially. But you're, it doesn't really fall. You're comfortable the, dealing with that at a staff level? Yes. Okay. And as long as we have good communication and a reporting of what he's, what's occurring, then we know um, how the use is being served. Okay. Great. Thank you. I do, uh, being a, a public hearing, I want to let any other members of the public um, participate. Thank you. Thank you. We have one other member. This is a chance to participate. Okay. <laughs> then I'll uh, close the public hearing portion of this item and uh, invite council discussion and potential action. Would anyone like to start? Councilmember Moeller is leaning forward. Congratulations on finding office space in Yellowfield. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, I, you know, I have no reservations um, about this as it's uh, presented. I'm fine with the sign, and uh, I'd also like to suggest that if it doesn't work out for you, any changes should be a ministerial action by the staff. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Hall? Uh, I have no additional comments other than, um, again, I, it sounds like a, a reasonable project to, to put forward and, you know, outside of reevaluating potentially the, the words tasting room and the implication that might have for people such as my two-year-olds that get lost on the way up there um, they aren't going to be tasting are they looking for wine they might be actually <laughs> came from my house um but that said they uh you know i would just keep that in mind and um, i think the reporting requirement which as it's presented makes sense and just something that we should keep on top of thanks councilmember dornbecker well first of all i'd like to thank you because ever since you've been in town you've been very um good about participating in our town-wide events and supporting us mm -hmm. and i see no problem at all with any of this either so thank you vice mayor no i generally agree i uh like i said on the on the sign i would just contemplate that again and um i totally agree with what you just said um, you've been very involved in uh and I appreciate your donations and personal involvement. And I would uh, also say you sort of made the comment about flexibility. You know, if you've got four journalists in and they're going to spend the afternoon there and, and you're going to have lunch brought in or something, I mean, I don't know if that's really a big special event. It's an office use, in my opinion. So, um, so good luck, and I'm just sorry that I don't get to lease that space. <laughs> yeah, the concerns I had have been addressed. Um, what, one thing that I was concerned about was parking. That was addressed already, uh, and I, I shared my questions, and, and you answered them to my satisfaction, and staff did as well. So I can support this application also. Um, I think it's um, we're, we try to be flexible when we can. When we're uh, trying to help you succeed uh, in your business, we're not going to get in the way unless there's a real uh, serious concern about the impact on, on the town. So. Um, I think with the rest of the council, I'm going to just say, uh, you know, good luck and uh, speed moving, moving forward. I, I think you're going to find out whether the language on that sign is driving your patrons crazy going up the stairs to find a locked door and says go downstairs. Uh, that's, you know, that's up to you to figure out how, how that works. My original concern was also confusing uh, p the use for page being on that north side if the sign is there, are people going to walk in thinking they're walking into Cornerstone when it's really Page? But that's, again, something that you and, and uh, Mr. Page get to worry about. So um, <laughs> not really our, our concern at this level. So uh, I'll entertain a motion if there's one. I'll make a motion to approve resolution number 3095-13, approving the use, approving use permit amendment to allow Cornerstone to expand its use into second floor office space previously occupied by Colwell Banker and consisting of a meeting and conference room space and a VIP private tasting room located at 6505 Washington Street, APN 036, stroke 081, stroke 011. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Clarification that we're striking the third condition proposed oh. by staff. I didn't even. What is that third condition? The one about the sign. So it puts no restrictions on the sign if we strike condition number three. Right. I've got to look back at that language. Hold on just a second. I could just flip to the page. Oh. Seven or nine. Right. I see it now. It's on seven. 
The motion maker needs to. Uh, yeah, uh, I make that motion and removing uh, item number three under the use permit, conditional use permit component. Who's second? I'll second. So with the change, we're removing uh, the third condition of approval, which basically means the applicant's presentation as it was presented to us. Correct. Correct. Okay. And the original motion and the original seconder have agreed to that. So now we'll uh, ask questions again. Uh, if he uh, decides to change that, he just comes to you guys, right? Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All in favor of that amended motion? Aye. 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 There we go. Okay, Same I wanna, result. I want to thank, thank the council. It's a privilege to be part of the community. We love it here, and I would really like to, to thank the, the staff for the way they guide you through this process. It's uh, very helpful, and uh, since we don't know what we're doing, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. good to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, now I was all set up for the next item, but now I have to go back and find it. Oh, it's it's so budget great. workshop <laughs> number one, really? Yes. Oh, are you just leaving that? I thought it was a placeholder. <laughs> All right, a budget workshop discussing our fiscal 2013-14 projections, et cetera. Mayor and Council, uh, this is the official launch of the budget season for you. We've already had some preliminary discussions, as you recall, on the CIP workshop, and staff has been working. We're going to go through this at a fairly quick pace, um, but I also want to point out that while we do so, and I think this year a lot of the news is good, I want to make sure that everybody understands this conversation we're having today is incredibly important as we move forward. The foundation of our budget is based on the assumptions and the direction that you give today, and if there are some areas of concern or interest, it's vitally important that that be shared with staff so that we can work to identify and resolve and try to address those to the council's satisfaction. As many of you know, with your help, we've sort of developed a format to help guide our conversations in shaping the budget that appears to be working well for us. So uh, this is the fourth year with slight modification of this particular format. So Kathleen and I are gonna go through a series of these. If you have questions, please do let us know. We are gonna to try to move through at a fairly you know, logical and quick pace because of, of the background that we do believe the council has on this topic. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kathleen to discuss the initial budget discussion and our objectives. Thank you. Mayor, council members, uh, so we're, we're kicking off our, our budget parameter discussion and I'd just like to start by saying that we're continuing using our three-year trend analysis, especially with our revenue. And of course, I'm gonna focus on our three key revenues, um, TOT, sales tax, and property tax, which make up about 85% of our general fund. Um, and we'll go through these, and these are our preliminary projections. We may be fine-tuning them as we get a little further along into budget workshops two and three. <laughs> Um, so with that said, um, start off with our, our biggest revenue source, which is our TOT. And this should be a familiar number since we did talk about it at mid-year. Um, we did receive $5 million, a record setting for the town, of TOT in fiscal year 2011-12. And we're projecting $5.2 million for the current year, fiscal year 12-13. <coughs> So right now, preliminarily, we're projecting 5.2 million for 13-14, although over the next couple of months, we'll be tracking how we're doing, and we, we do keep seeing that we're above last year, month after month. So we may increase that slightly as we get a little further along um, into the next budget workshop. Yes. So, so may I interrupt at the time? For, yes, these please, are the big ones. we want so, this to be interactive. Okay. So, uh, so let me just repeat what I just heard. Yes. We're tracking towards 5.2 million this year, correct? Yes, and possibly this, higher. Okay, but we're tracking towards 5.2. Yes. Okay. And we're going to budget 5.2 in the following year? That's our expectation? That's our preliminary number right now. So I, 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 I do want to reserve the right to bring back a higher number if the town manager and I see we have like two more months of tax returns we'll accumulate okay. before we really want to finalize these projections so we may adjust that up to five three or so 
Okay. I, I would just, I mean, and I'll speak for myself and not necessarily okay. the council. My direction this year would be, I mean, $5.2 million is, seems pretty significant. I don't know that I would budget that you're going to do the same that you expect you're going to do this year just because there's a lot more competition throughout the valley. There is. Pricing is certainly going to be an issue, and, and that would affect the Yonville hotels as well. And my only comment, because we're on the big revenue number, is that if we got to hold anything tight, we better start with that number. Make, make it conservative and yep. adjust it mid-year. We, we can take that approach. And that's my well, predilection. So we appreciate. We also heard loud and clear last year Council's concern that we were being too conservative that, no, with that number. So we are really trying to find that sweet spot because there are moving pieces to that that we don't have complete control. Sure. Right now, we do believe, and when we look at our three-year trending, we do think that that's realistic. Yeah. Um, but I also appreciate you're, you're never going to hear Kathleen and I argue about being a little bit conservative and coming back at mid-year and saying, hey, things are a little better. Because we don't have, um, you guys know this, and I had an opportunity to share today with the Napa Valley Vintners, our, our budget does not have a lot of opportunity to make up places. Right. If we have a problem in TOT or sales tax, we're not very diverse. So we do share that concern, but we also want to make sure we're hitting the, the council's concern that we're not too low on this number because of the impact that it has on the overall expenditure side of the yeah. budget. Yeah, and I, I'm just, I mean, we, we were able to plan from an expenditure standpoint with reserves at 4.8 and 5 million. Right. I would offer at least a recommendation that we start there. And if we are making an adjustment towards the middle of the year of $200,000, I'll be grateful for that. Right. But there's a Point lot more competition in this, in this valley. And I think that the pricing that we've seen and the lift that we've seen in the That's RevPAR, the rev parts of, uh, of an issue, and I'll, right. I'll leave right. it at that. So well, no, I, I, I do agree with that comment because we are relying on a continuing strong <coughs> tourism industry in the whole Bay Area and the Napa Valley, and, and you're right. We have our little niche, and 5.2 is realistic, and we can stick with that. So before we get off this one topic, I think the, we, we should maybe handle these big three projections uh, independently as we go along. So the sure. vice mayor wanted to comment on this this discussion right now well i wanted to completely agree with what you just said okay, okay um, thank you very much exactly and, and my my rationale on that is um i can say with my business last year i'm not sure about yours so far this year last year was exceptionally good don't understand why fully and uh, uh in terms of revenue side and i when i go and talk to other restaurants and say man it was a crazy week this week they're all like yeah it was crazy or i'm like why is it so slow this week they're all like yeah it's so slow so there's a lot of it all falls together right. and this year is just a little bit down from last year okay um in terms of and that so that whether that will continue i know we're not in the same fiscal year right but it's just a little bit not as robust okay so you know so we always say someday we're going to top out well i do want to clarify we, we should um, just be on that little bit conservative side Got it. our tot trending is actually higher than what we're projecting no, sales, I understand that. sales tax is trending and I think it is important as we start to learn our revenue stream because what keeps our 451 rooms full versus the restaurants versus the tasting room are different. But yes, we're still, we believe, being conservative in the number that we're, we're presenting. So I agree with your conservatism. So any other uh, council comments about this particular item? Councilmember Dornbecker? I'm very concerned this year because the uncertainty of the um, what's being done on the federal level could impact tourism. If you know, if suddenly it becomes really difficult to travel at the airports and things, we may. I don't want us to be surprised. So for once, I'm agreeing that I would rather we be on the conservative side. And I don't want to. I want the council to make sure they also understand that with the current projection, we will need to add a little bit of funding when we put the base budget together into the stabilization reserve, which is the 10% set aside to match the TOT. And that is also, uh, I think, Council Member Dornbecker, you have a very you know, good point. We do have a place that we would go to first to look at balancing the budget should there be a revenue offset before we would get into our 20%. Um, emergency reserve and I think you know we wrestled a little bit on that dual policy and I think we've come up with a, ultimately a, a, a good spot for this community that reflects our 
our revenue stream. But yes, we, we, we tend to be conservative and I will just point out that we're also trying to match what you told us to do last year and be a little more aggressive. So we're balancing, uh, we're balancing what the council's communicated, but we hear you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Hall, why don't you go ahead and uh, move on the discussion to the sales tax issue. You had a um, comment? Well, I mean, I know that sales tax, and I think I read it was 935000 a year ago, projecting roughly 970, and we're, we're, we're looking at it being, I don't know, it's not fifty six. It's not $60,000 higher, $45,000 higher. Is right. that correct? Yes. And 45000 is 2%? Yes. And that's a reasonable assumption? Well, it, right. It's just actually assuming growth of 4% from what we're projecting this year. And I also want to point out that's just a, a base projection, and I actually think, if anything, it's still a little soft because we really haven't done any metrics to analyze the Chicho and the opening of the R and D restaurant. And I, when I say that, we're just we don't have a basis to generate a, a revenue stream on those. But what we have not done is Kathleen and I haven't taken those numbers and ratcheted them up by another factor. We've basically took our projected growth that we're trending. So, it, you know, we figure there may be some redistribution of some of the restaurant sales amongst everybody. There may be truly increased growth. We don't fully know that. So we're not really identifying saying, you know, here's $40,000 more because we see the restaurant opening. We, we could be pleasantly surprised in this number based on what actually happens with those two restaurants. Right, but you're already taking that into consideration, town manager, with the 970. You've got run-in on your new restaurants already, and they won't continue. You won't double that next year. They won't run in no, And acts. like I say, we're also trending 8 to 10% a month higher. So when we track all this, we're having to be realistic with what our numbers are telling us and the metrics that we're looking at. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm... I'm less inclined to worry about that um, at forty five fifty five thousand dollars I mean there's going to be some additional run in for the other, for the new restaurants i'm right right we we like Steve said, we still believe this is not an ultra conservative number but conservative enough that we're comfortable with it based on what we've seen um, come through and with analysis um, help from muni services to develop some of this analysis for our projection. I have one question. Yes. Have you done the math backwards and determined what sales in the restaurants have to occur for that number to be real mm. or the, the entire business community? And what is that number? I don't have it off the top of my head, but I could get it for you. So if it's a million bucks and it's 8%, is it 8%? What do we get in the form of the sales tax? We only get 1%. 1%. Percent. This represents our 1% share and 75% <laughs> of percentage our... Point, right? Correct. Yeah. One percentage point of that 8% percent that's collected so you know what we're looking at is 75 percent of our current number is derived from restaurants we know that down to where it's so we have two new restaurants coming online that haven't even reported yeah. the other growth segments tasting rooms which is having we're, we're seeing for the most part positive growth in tasting room sales sales tax generated over the prior year and then the smaller remaining segment is uh, core retail, and then our, our one gas station generates a noticeable sales tax generation. That's our sales tax broken down again. It's almost as simplistic as our TOT. I mean, it's, we're not very diverse in our segments. We so, do have a gas station. So but, but maybe I heard this wrong. We get 1% of all the sales tax generated in the town. Yes. One percentage point. One percentage point of all the sales generated in town. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. Well, no, one percent of the eight percent. Okay. In other words, you pay eight percent. That makes more sense. Right. Okay. So I, what I'm just saying is of the it's of that eight percent, one percent comes back to local. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Now I understand. Thank you. So the point I wanted to make about uh, this topic, I'm sure we're looking at underperforming retail in Washington Square for this whole last year. I would and say so that's true. I have to believe, and especially once they finally rent the final vacancy, if it's retail, uh, we're looking at better numbers going forward, I would anticipate. We also have a new retail and tasting room in Heston 
that doesn't exist yet mm-hmm. that hasn't been factored in. So That's true. That's true. we have not only the Chichio ongoing, right. but we have some new, brand new, 100% unknown right. uh, joining the this <coughs> figure. So I think That's there's some of that coverage of the wiggle room that we're right. talking about. That's, Fair enough. Yeah. That's why we do assume a 4% growth, but not. Okay. So we, we do still feel that's somewhat conservative, okay. given those factors. Any other discussion about the sales tax component? Well, j- just one uh, question yes. for clarification. These You said 6% in 2010, 11 in 2011. This is year-over-year year percentages? Yes. Okay. Property tax? Councilor Hall, you want to? I don't have any on any, com- any no. comments on the property tax component here? No. If not, then we'll just. I just want. I do want to share one thing. We now have officially reached what is not a normal model in local government, where property tax is the third most significant revenue stream. Um, Our model is very, very skewed towards the other two. But you know, um, when we go into the expenditures, but this really does show the taxes that our residents and our businesses pay are relatively minor in terms of what the business costs of operating the center prize are. I know you guys know that, but part of that's making sure our community understands, you know, 75% of our real revenue is directly, not indirectly, but directly derived from tourism. Thank you. Kathleen? Yes. So we, we are anticipating receiving the full state COPS grant of $100,000, and the state did um, approve in 2012 SB 1023 and that did provide for the town to receive its share of the COPS grant which would be $100,000 and it also did away with some of the bureaucratic steps we used to have to do like holding a separate public hearing to approve and having a uh, fiscal oversight committee at the county so it actually eliminated some of that um, so we are plugging that into the budget, and we're always happy to have that to help fund our law enforcement services. So that's kind of the highlight on revenue. We're obviously still working on our other revenues, and we will bring back the master fee schedule, and we'll discuss other types of revenues with that. Um, but looking at some of our um, expenditure categories, some of the things that we know we are factoring into the budget and we want you to be aware of or you might have comments on. And this includes our Napa Animal Control Shelter. Uh, that cost is going to increase by about 23% up to $16,520. And that's been over the last three or four years, I believe. We've had a cost phase in where the county's asked us to get to to pay our full share of the cost. And and can I just stop right there? Because yes. I'm infamous for talking about this, so I yes. might as well say something here. You know, 23%. I mean, where does that come from? It's, uh, you know, I read something recently in the paper <coughs> because, you know, these folks really aren't doing too much. They've told them to go step up and go catch some stray dogs, you know, that people now can come claim. So, you know, I, I definitely... Would like to. I, I don't know why. Is there something that yes, says me, we have to have a vet in town to use another service? There's two things, and let me try to answer. First of all, the county has, when they chose to allocate the cost directly out to everybody, they gave us a five year phase. So the reason the cost is going up 23% is not their actual increase in cost, it's the fact that they're working towards getting us to our fair share allocation and we actually agreed to that when we entered into this so that's that's the biggest driver in this although the county is very good at their a87 cost allocation formula which is a chagrin Um, we're evaluating this the the challenge that we have is we do have to have a mechanism with which to deal with animal control and shelter i have not been able to find a situation that is plausible and it's further compounded by the fact that our contracts with the sheriff and they use napa county animal control so i'm i hear you guys loud and clear that's why the footnotes in there that's why i want in the staff report we know that you're frustrated with the fact that at year five we will be spending more on our contribution to the animal shelter than we are on managing our affordable housing stock I get that. So when is year five? Two more years. Okay. The uh, other question is, um, I'm so mad I can 
barely even think about this. Let's get some metrics. Yeah. How many dogs are taken from Yonville it, to Napa? I, with all due, I, I just, how many dead birds I, or whatever? They use the population formula, and it's no, the metric. No, I, I know that, but I just, I would like to have some information. I, I will get, you're not going to like it. It's very small. I know that. I'm just telling okay, you. At least it's information. We're working on coming up with an exit strategy. I don't have one for you yet that I can, uh, that I hear your interest, but I don't have an exit strategy for us. You know, I do know that Calistoga. Well, and to be fair, this is the third year of a five-year agreement we've already agreed to. Now, a separate issue can be if you would like to uh, challenge the appropriateness of the county's uh, shelter program, that's, that's fine. You can do that. But not through this. We're not going to not pay what we agreed to pay. Yeah, the number 23 no. percent is a high number because of the ramp up factor. I, I want to continue. We're going to get to a number in two years that's 100 percent coverage. With your all support, I will continue to look and try to better understand our alternative service delivery options outside of the animal shelter. But we are challenged and. Um, you know, there is speculation that St. Helena may pull out of the structure as well. They have different veterinary option choices under contract. That's where I think most of our energy, I've got to carve out time to figure out how to come up with a service model that meets the minimum requirements of the state to figure out how to do that. And then, you know, we put money aside and on a, on a daily basis pay the vet to do the structure. I just don't have that in place. And there's other elements such as how do you promote, market it, hours of operation, and if it's not proximal to Yountville, there's other compounding. There is a there is a vet in American Canyon that's interested, but I don't know that that's going to be considered an appropriate alternative. Right. So I hear you. We're equally frustrated, um, but I don't have an exit strategy Great. yet. Vice Mayor? <clears throat> I understand the frustration, but if I'm doing my math right, even in two years, we're talking about $22,000, and we're looking at $7.1 million of revenue. So when you talk about carving out effort and time, it ain't that high on my priority list. Pardon my bad English. Okay, that, any, any other topics about the shelter, Councilor Dornbecker? I have to say that I agree with Lewis once again. Okay, moving forward, Kathleen. Yes. The next items? Yes. Um, the Napa Housing Authority contract, <coughs> that's a flat amount from last year. We did enter a two-year contract. So that's we're budgeting that at the $29,790 uh, for all that they do to monitor our housing program for us. Um, for our fire and emergency ser medical services contract, we're in a two-year agreement. So next fiscal year will be the second year of that agreement. And our total cost, not to exceed amount, not necessarily the amount we will pay, because um, they bill us for actual costs, is $568,000. And then from that, they net some property tax assessments, which are generally about $80,000. So um, that's that. We also have our law enforcement agreement with the county sheriff's department, and we're be entering into the last year of a three-year agreement with them, and that's a 3% increase, and we'll be budgeting $884,800 for that contract for 1314. Yes. Thank you. So, um, you know, these are obviously critical and important public services for us, but so, if I recall correctly, um, there was a reimbursement due to a contractual miscalculation. Is that imbued into these numbers? It is. This is the maximum exposure. So when we budget, it'll be less, but we'll put that as our, and more importantly, what had happened is they simply billed us the maximum and not the actual. And when we caught that, they did rectify Thank that. Thank you. So moving ahead, we have our PERS retirement program costs. And we now have three different tiers. Um, most of our current employees fall into tier one but anyone that's hired after June 30, 2010 um, falls into Tier 2. Unless they're coming in new after January 1, 2013, then they're under the Pension Reform Act. 
um, and then they fall under that category labeled new members. So you can see um, that the tier two and the pension reform um, is definitely a lower rate and over time will net in some cost savings. Vice Mayor? Yes. <clears throat> if I recall when we did the tier two, the 2% at 55, that was the, let's call it the, that was the most we could go down. Is that correct? We were not allowed. I know there was PERS restrictions on you can only do, you know, you can only restrict so much. And does that new law allow it to go to 62 instead of 55? Let me, let me back up a little bit. And the column new members 2% at 62, that is now what any truly new employee comes in at. Understood. That set. Yeah. Tier 2 was a compromise and a negotiations. And we chose that formula. And if you look at the savings between oh, the tier one rate there they were half and that was the council was very comfortable that that was a good place to go for the most part you're not going to find too many new people coming on to tier two unless they are an existing pers member from another agency coming here then they would have the option you know we would move them in there if it's a brand new hire they go at two percent at 62 no one new will be added to tier one. So and all of our new hires will fall into either the tier two or the new member rate going forward. And as Kathleen's pointed out, we now have employees in all three of those mm -hmm. categories. So for a small agency, the accounting detail necessary to manage that is um, intriguing. So, so just to clarify for everybody, uh, an employee comes from another jurisdiction and 10 years experience and they come here they work for two years the exposure to Yonville in this pro in the program is limited to their service they for would Yonville. yes and they would come in as a two percent at 55 like Steve said they would come in at tier two because they're already a PERS member but if we hire somebody with no governmental experience per the Pension Reform Act, they come in as a new member, 2% at 62 is their formula. Yeah, my point was more clarifying we're not paying another jurisdiction's retirement no. if somebody transfers in in that level. No, we Just only pay for the years that they work here. Any other questions about PERS? Okay. Moving forward. So moving along, our health insurance <coughs> rates, these don't come out until August and then they're effective January 1 but in looking at what the trend has been over the last few years we're um, estimating an increase of 15 percent for health insurance so that'll be seven and a half percent for the fiscal year um, with relation to um, negotiated COLA for employees um, as you remember last year employees agreed to um, start paying for paying their 8% PERS and that was offset by an 8% increase to their salary so that they were still even in other words they didn't give anything up so that was done in anticipation of the pension reform so that was good because it kind of got us ahead of that so now for 2013-14 uh, there will be a COLA it'll fall somewhere between two and a half and three and a half percent and it's based on the CPI that will be published for February and that'll be coming out mid-March so then we'll know what that is yes Vice Mayor. yeah I'm sorry you went through the previous one very quickly could you um, on the employer and retiree health insurance rates yes <clears throat> the second sentence says we anticipate rates to increase by 15 percent or seven and a half percent for the fiscal year yes is that explain that to me well because it goes in a timing issue January yes the, the new rate goes in effect for the calendar year, January 1. Okay. So for half the fiscal year, we'll pay the old rate. So basically January the 14 1, it goes part? Up. Yes. Thank you. Okay, that's all. Thank you. So that's all I had to say oh, yeah. about uh, COLA. Are we okay with that one? We'll keep moving? We'll, okay. We'll plug that in when we know what that is. Uh, risk management, we're not certain, um, but the town manager will know more because he's an active member of that committee. But we do anticipate for liability and workers' comp approximately a ten to twenty thousand dollar increase. Um, so we'll factor that in when we know it and let you know what that was as we go through our budget. And so that's the premium increase. Yes. On a baseline of. Well, I don't know. 
Well, it's a ten to twenty thousand dollars, but is it on a million dollar plan premium or is it okay? So is it a fifty percent, hundred percent increase? Do we know? A couple percent. It's a nominal. It's it's it varies because that's our total program. We mind you know we have liability. Uh, we also buy coverage, business interruption coverage on our key revenues generators. We have our workers' comp. Um, we maintain, uh, um, <clears throat> we turn that over. We also have our bonds, our, you know, so it's a net program, and, and we'll, I'm just drawing, I didn't bring the full budget, but, you know, we That's spend. It. Kathleen has it. She's leafing through it as, as you speak. What we do, our total is several hundred thousand in all of our risk management So it's, it's a, it's a, what would be considered a normal. Well, we're letting you know, it's a little increase. higher because um, Parsac's not real happy, but we're, you know, we're seeing some movement in the insurance industry, and they're basically notifying that, uh, especially on the workers' comp side, based on some of the transitions in medical care and costs that they're raising premiums on. So that's going to get passed back on. It's all getting cheaper. It's, you know, there's moving pieces, but yes, that's. Under Arnie, it was cheaper. All okay. Right. <clears throat> you're, you're about, I think you're about to get your. My answer? <clears throat> your number. Just a relative increase. It. If we add together the workers' comp liability and property, it's approximately 130,000. Yeah. So, so that a, 10 to 20,000 increase is is fairly small. So six. Well, no, it's six right. to 12 percent is what you just right. said. Right. But I will also remind you, last year okay. we had a $28,000 credit because then we closed prior claim years. We benefit from that. So you know that's why it is a pool. We are not buying. Um, our good success has a positive impact on potential. It is sort of a reinvestment of our funding at some point. We end up with products that are the equivalent of insurance coverage, but as opposed to you know, directly buying it where the profit would go to the insurance company, we share when we have managed risk. Also, if you may recall, we've been receiving approximately 8,500 in the last two years on um, safety grant program. Um, administered through our contributions with PARSAC. So it's some um, a moving number, but we will learn a little bit more in late March. Okay. All right. Now we're going to move to some key service assumptions, budget parameters. One, and this is where it's really important that you let us know, we're continuing to maintain existing core areas of services at the same level of service. No new services, initiatives, or programs will be introduced as part of our budget process unless accompanied with an identified funding source. So am I, is, that, is that still generally the mantra that you want us to build? Or are there programs and services that you want us to start doing some cost analysis on? Councilor Dornbecker? Well, I have a question, and that is that um, in 2015, we're going to be celebrating 50 years of being chartered as a town. Um, and I think that it would behoove us to start looking for funding, you know, grants and funding sources to help us because we're obviously going to want to do something uh, about that, you know, uh, town wide and promotional wide. And so I think that um, we need to look at that now. That's only a one time thing really I mean, we don't do it every year but that's one thing that I think that we should you know take a look at now rather than wait too long uh, we will be bringing the ad hoc committee together shortly to start looking at some of those things I think probably rather than grants we're probably more looking at sponsorships and some private funding opportunities I mean I don't I'm, I don't want to preclude grants but I'm just saying until we have a specific objective I, I don't know that 50th anniversary events are necessarily going to meet grant criteria. Now, sponsorships and coming up with a plan for businesses and individuals to be involved in helping, and again, knowing what we want to do, yes. So we will get that ad hoc that is committee. going to you know, also take some of your staff resources to help put this together, too. If that's the council's directive, that's well, exactly it, what know, it will do. But you're right. That's why the first start is, um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, council member Moeller and Dornbecker are the ad hoc committee. And I, I believe now that we've moved forward with greenhouse gas, uh, I believe you've got an invitation from Sandra as the historic ad hoc committee to get started. And Samantha and I will start scheduling the ad hoc committee meeting for the uh, 50th anniversary celebration. 
So you just added some meetings to your <laughs> but, schedule. But no, yeah, I, I appreciate time, the, the point being, you're right. If we want to have some seed money to do some things, then we need to start thinking about what that is. Or if you're going to allocate it, what is that going to look like? So that may be something when we look at unassigned fund balance, if we continue to have a positive year, you might want to set some aside for that. Or whatever feedback so I do think well, it's I just wanted to bring it up for yep. that very reason it's important. I think I think it's it's a, a good issue to to address the ad hoc committee can get started addressing it and bring back <coughs> recommendations on whether we need to actually budget anything yet or if we can just start planning and then start that outreach to get the chamber involved other businesses in the exactly. community yeah. all right um, Again, we continue to balance our budget with expenditures kept within available revenue. And what that really means is that we're looking, as, as we talked about, the key increases that we know are driving, but that when we look at we try to balance our existing service level and how we're doing it with the revenue. And I think we've demonstrated reasonably good success over the last two years at, at doing that. Um, so a question I've got at this point. Um, thankfully, the COPS funding is still coming through. I don't trust that from one year to the next is going to still be there. I don't so, either. So I wonder if we should be uh, or do we have a mechanism in place that we could backfill that that deputy we would lose. You Okay, let me Okay, I got to back up a few I know things. it's not a deputy no, for $100,000. Right. I'm I'm just you simplifying. What you have under our contract that 100,000 is just we apply it to our contract it doesn't buy a deputy if anything it buys a quarter of a you know half of a deputy in the sense of how we structure it it goes to our overall contract the short answer to how we would approach that is one you build that into your overall expenditure plan so if the 100,000 cops grant went away we take it off the revenue we would initially build the budget at our full cost for the sheriff's department mm -hmm. and it would compete with our uh, available other things and we'd see what our balance was if then we had a problem and it was a priority then we would look at that five hundred and twenty thousand dollar economic stabilization reserve as your first priority or you would just what I would tell you the first thing I would do is try to see what other areas might be trimmed keeping the sheriff's contract knowing that we need to cover that dollar amount you know we might trim five thousand more out of a um, some other funding source, be it a, a park and rec expenditure, being it a, a, a public works. But we would balance first within unless we got to a point where it was not satisficing to the council and they felt that a service level was being diminished and they would rather draw from that stabilization fund. I think it just kind of goes to every state funding source we have that we right. just need to be careful that we're not anticipating blindly but on the right. other hand when we put our budget together much like several years you know we actually took it out and kept it out until it was documented this year it's in so again for our planning purposes the state's telling us we're going to get it mm -hmm. so we're only going to hurt or make our budget more challenging if we don't include it in the initial it's but I don't a, think it's more of a note mm -hmm. reminder yes. parking lot item yes yep. definitely um, continue with our inclusion of our 100,000 annual budget contingency and as you know that is uh, different there is a $25,000 town manager contingency we've been very good and this is more of a circumstance that if something <coughs> came up differently we haven't used this so in most cases it gets saved and then reapplied um, but it gives you guys a little bit of potential should something come up that you want to resolve or identify without having to uh, amend and modify the budget um, we're implementing or recommending the implementation of council policy that our OPEB internal rate will go to 9% consistent with the approved council policy and then it will go to 10% next year uh, current balance of the OPEB irrevocable trust as of about last month is 908,000 I'm, I'm suspecting the vice mayor might have a comment on this item just want to point out that we are planning on underfunding our OPEB costs by 40 <clears throat> percent excuse me 40 percent next year we're planning on underfunding it by 33 percent and I was going to look up the budget but I think our uh, revenues over the last couple of years have gone up dramatically 
So it continues to bother me that we borrow from future councils to pay for stuff today when we know this is happening. So I just want to make that statement again. And, and it bothers say, me every year. I, I almost feel like I should not even support the budget if we, I know we're borrowing money from the future to spend. Yes, Kathy? Well, I think we'll have a better picture of where we're at when we do get our updated actuarial study. Which will be when? Which will be by June to be included in the, <coughs> the numbers for the CAFR. It's less so than 40%. I, I, it may be. And, and two. And two other caveats to your comment, Vice Mayor. One, I think the council and the staff understand your position, and I do reference the fact that we are we are following adopted council policy. You said it very well. Moreover, we are also, I think, we are, without looking at the council's also stated policy that when we review on assigned fund balance, because over the last two years we've actually been able to fully fund our ARC. And as you alluded to, I would argue, we haven't um, underfunded in those last two years. So the council, you know, I would anticipate. I believe in actually the last three years, I think, and in the, in the way it's all worked out, we have fully funded it once and, it was all set. And I knew no, it's a so two-step. I don't under, understate that. It, it we is, don't plan on fully funding it. It's a two-step process. It, yes. Well, I've. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to know at this uh, particular time, in, at, in the present, how many retirees um, from staff do we have collecting medical benefits? Uh, it's in the full report, and I don't have that in front of me. It's about 20, some or slightly less than 20. Do you have a dollar <coughs> figure on what that costs us? There's annually? a full, I mean, yes. We've given, there's a whole itemized, yeah, I mean. It's $80,000 a year right now, approximately. Okay. And right now we're covering that as our pay as our go and building the irrevocable trust. Because that's the other thing I want to point out that. With this council stewardship, you've gone from no real fund balance to an irrevocable trust approaching a million dollars. And that's a very significant feat. And as the finance director alluded, when we do have our next valuation, that factor also gets taken into in terms of what's our, because right now we are still putting, uh, we're paying our pay as we go, and we're putting money into the bank. Well, and what I'll, I'll follow up on the direction the council has given is is to keep the flexibility of the <coughs> unrestricted revenues as they come in, and then we have had, as was just pointed out, great tolerance for adding additional funding to OPEB. So I, I, you know, I don't think the council's overall position has changed from that. I I, I totally understand. And I think we share the objective Make my of annual trying, trying to maximize as much as we can the OPAB contribution while making sure that other services that you as a council as a whole want are delivered. The next one we've already discussed, and it happens to deal with the PERS retirement programs. We'll be cleaning this one up going forward, but as of now we have three programs. You've seen the cost difference, so now over time. Uh, because of the size of our agency, you will not see significant savings uh, until we have a few more new employees. But uh, you can see the, that it uh, reduces quite a bit. The agency share will either be 6.25% or approximately 11. So going forward, we have achieved in partnership with our employees the restructuring. Uh, and Steve, if I can interrupt you there. Um, Best you can tell, that's still in the strong minority of municipalities that have been able to reach that kind of multi-tiered structure, or has that climate caught well, up with itself? The new Pension Reform Act has changed the climate considerably. Mm -hmm. So, but I, what I would say is that we've accomplished most all of the pension reform and meeting the compliance requirements in a. Um, in a positive way with our employees and working. Now, there are em there are agencies that have not addressed the employee contribution port and how in the next five years they ultimately go about doing that. Some of those agencies have a long ways to go. We don't. We have that in place. Um, our, our employees are now uh, contributing up to the 8% employee share. Um, obviously, if their employee share is 6.25, we're not charging them 8%. 
but um, the new employee under the what I'm calling tier three or the two percent at 62 their share is actually only 6.25 as well it is uh, jointly and equally matched on the funding structure I, I kind of asked a loaded question because I was um, what I'm seeing is the discrepancy at other municipalities being significantly larger than ours thanks to the cooperative and proactive effort by this council and this uh, employee association I think other municipalities are going to start losing people because of the dramatic shift or not being able to hire new people as readily because it's going to be a, dr a more dramatic change you know there's hopefully a, to our advantage there's a concern out there I will tell you that our biggest weakness is going to be management and department head positions because in most cases we have moved people from other agencies into those because we don't have depth so what's not really known yet is what's that doing to the labor pool who who's willing to move um, with all due candor if you look at this table um, everyone here at the staff table has moved from another agency into this organization in the position they are in so I'm not going to be naive and tell you that you know there may be some consequences to that you know it's but it's a game changer now at the state level I, I think we've done some things to better position ourselves but the net result is is that going <coughs> forward you know the retirement plan is now very different and the funding structure is that affects current employees and that affects how they may choose to move and that's just real life now and we'll all deal with that yes. so uh, the next two are uh, with this council's leadership we've developed a five-year rate structure plans for both water and sewer and our implementation we are now in year three of those we didn't quite anticipate that there would be a a record drought in the middle of the rainy season that normally happens when the rates adjust in January but uh, nonetheless we are in year three of that plan uh, more importantly you know those actions are now starting to build the fund balance you've seen the reports on that and it's also providing the funding structure to pay for the capital projects that are necessary and mandated um, the next phrase has you know the climate in Sacramento for us has changed a little bit but uh, with passage of prop 22 and now prop 30 I think and I'm just going to phrase it for the current budget year and I'll just limit the thought the amount of potential taking that Sacramento can do that's really going to affect our budget in this immediate window is slim from what we're seeing however I don't I don't know that any of us really feel comfortable that there aren't people in Sacramento trying to figure out how to get our money or add mandates see mandates to me can be as equally concerning because we get charged with a responsibility that we weren't doing before that we have to pay for because th they've quit funding state mandates even you know they kept a little disclaimer this really is not a state mandate they'll figure out how to do it uh, we generally do or so I mean I'm real concerned about that um, Council Member Dornmecker also missed a relatively a relatively new phenomena, which is will there be any trickle down or subsequent effects from sequestering or the inability of our <coughs> uh, federal officials to resolve? And I think the short answer right now is I don't see anything directly in our budget, but again, it's that trickle down. Will there something be from another entity? Um, does another entity you know start raising their permit and regulatory compliance that's where I start seeing the amount of money we're now spending on permits regulatory compliance they're shifting stuff that's where we're probably going to start seeing and uh, you know what was a ten thousand dollar permit on renewal will be thirty you know those are the types of things that I project um, state agencies used to look at um, much like we do if there was an issue they used to work on compliance to understand it now they're looking at cost recovery the agency needs to recover and so if there's a potential violation even though it's an itsy bitsy minor one that was really discretionary you're starting to see the state agencies you know the staff is having to look at that from a cost recovery standpoint those are some of the things that concern me 
because they're also very hard for us to understand and track because we don't have any frequency of how that would happen. Um, and they generally can be very bizarre and odd things. You know, we, we're, we're working on um, <clears throat> our Hopper Creek storm mitigation. You know, it, it astounds me that, you know, we're going to spend probably 300000 on environmental and permit and regulatory conditions to get flood mitigation projects passed. Our current recycled water project that we're doing, Graham, what would you say? We're probably approaching, again, a quarter of a million of that is all directly related to regulatory agents' compliance testing. And more importantly and most frustrating to me is having to bring three or four state and federal regulatory agencies into a room and go, you want condition Y, which is directly opposite of what this agency wants. We can't do the two, and we're spending resources to negotiate amongst them to try to figure out how to get something approved. That is, you know, it's the most frustrating part, I think, especially for Graham and I right now, is there is no logic. And, you know, the, the, the state people and individuals are really nice, and they're trying to be helpful, but the end product is not. I mean, you look at, so anyway, that's, I'm sorry, that's just, I'm digressing, but that's a real frustrating challenge. And I think that's where we see more potential for some uncertainty in our budget. But I want to move real quickly to a positive one. <laughs> Maintaining the expanded hours and trolley service for the Yountville trolley. We are projecting that that's the council policy direction. Uh, again, I want to point that we made that change and it's been very successful as demonstrated by the 738% ridership increase. Uh, we have a good news on community cleanup day funding as council member Moeller shared with you earlier. For the next four to five years, um, <clears throat> this will be able to be continued to be funded out of an operating grant from the hauler. Um, we are going to be looking and continue to look at some modifications to our program to see long term if there may be some cost effective ways. The program will look very similar as it did this year, but unlike last year where we paid the bill, we won't pay this year. So that's a positive, although in the grand scheme of things, you know, that's a $8,500 to $10,000 shift on our budget, but it is the right way. Um, <clears throat> Limited maintenance approach to our street projects, that's basically funding at our current level, which is healthier than most of our neighboring jurisdictions. We have been, as you know, using our highway gas user tax and augmenting some general fund. You've also approved lease revenue bonds, and our major focus for the next two years will be on Yount Madison. But we're really also going to start planning and timing our capital projects as it relates to streets to um, better correlate with the revenue stream that will be available for Measure T uh, coming up in 2018. Also, obviously, we need to incorporate our payment for debt service for 2013 lease revenue bonds. Um, there is one other footnote. Historically, we have kept about 22 to 24,000 in the budget as a placeholder for potential li additional library hours. If terms were agreeable to the council and we're recommending continuation of that. The last two years the terms have not been agreeable. They did, get, they did not make it out of the ad hoc library committee and therefore ultimately they were never expended. And when I say terms, that was a combination of the council saying we're willing to, act, we're willing to pay for a little bit but we want some movement and some expansion on the part of the, the library system. So. This would be seed money potentially should a, a positive outcome be generated. Councilmember Dornbecker, do you have anything to add? I would like to. Thank you for bringing that up because that was something that I wanted to discuss. And we have not, uh, the ad hoc committee has not discussed this with the county yet. But I think in terms of timing, while the evaluation of the volunteer program is going on, I believe that it would be a good time to talk about it with the county and uh, use it as some leverage to rearrange some hours and maybe get an additional day. And so I, I really am glad to know that we're going to keep this in the budget because I forgot how much it was going to cost to build the path from Oak Circle to the church along Hopper Creek. But I, 
I sort of think that the library, and that was going to be over $100,000, I do remember that, but I think that the library hours are going to be more um, beneficial for our residents than, than um, the path behind the, to the church. So anyway, I'm very glad that we, I agree that we should keep that in. Mm -hmm. well, and that wasn't 24 that was expended because we were getting so little for that money mm -hmm. that the council decided that we were not going to spend it. And so we need to see movement from the from Napa County library system to provide and be a little more proactive like the ad hoc committee has done through the, you know, through the volunteer program, get them to move away from the calculation they're using at the broader level for the much larger uh, facilities it doesn't apply so well for Yonko. Well, that's why I want to be able to use this as a negotiating tool. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll, we'll tell them again, look, we have money to spend, but we're not going to spend it, you know, $24,000 for an hour, <laughs> which is basically what they were talking about, two, yeah. two hours. It was two, two hours. hours but. Yeah. Well, I, I did meet with uh, Diane and Dance about it so they know that, you know, we, we have this if, if it's something that we can work out. They also shared that uh, our library uh, hourly rate would be going up. So uh, what we used to think of 10500 is that no longer is, it would be going up. So I, I think we're all in the same agreement here, and we'll just have to. Well, we were all there together pitching the great partnership that we have with them, and hopefully they have taken that to heart, and uh, we'll see some movement. I, I'm just going to make one point of clarification. An operating expense related to the library is not related to an investment in a park in a path they're they're separate one would be an annual expense that we would incur if we wanted to continue the hours the other would be an investment in the infrastructure of the town so they're they're technically not related in my opinion and perhaps others would agree or disagree but i think we'll keep the money in there for now as a placeholder but they're arguably they're not related. i understand what you're saying okay okay and we move forward all right, we're getting towards the end. So this part looks very familiar to you because we start piggybacking on the CIP discussion, so I am going to be very brief. There's really only three significant areas that we're going to continue to be putting um, some funding for programs. Uh, phase three of our electronics record management system. Um, we're making slow and steady progress, and as the town clerk has shared with you, we're, you know, it, it's, it's a process. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic that we will get there sooner rather than later, but it's really, in our organization, it's both uh, staff resource allocation to prep the documents as well as the cost for the electronics records management. We seem to be finding that 40000 a year is a good pace for us, so we're going to continue. Improved town facility security. Um, we're going to try and take a more comprehensive approach at integrating our security and updating the community center. And in a polite way, I have to take a step backward, which is we have inadequate security at this facility and inadequate security at the um, <coughs> corporation yard. So part of that is right now um, it's a project for us to evaluate, understand the best use of technology uh, as the cost structure. So we're going to be moving forward. You'll see more about that. but. Um, we just, you know, we're using 1970s technology and we really do need to get up to speed and um, there is a little bit. The other one, and it's been introduced also as part of the CIP, we're in our final evaluation of some implementation strategies for GIS and we talked about it in the CIP. There will be a, a budget allocation of 100000 which will allow us to move forward with the acquisition of the equipment and architecture necessary to move forward and also third-party resources to help us jumpstart the data collection necessary to have meaningful data from which to use it. In a similar way, we don't have the capacity for our staff to go collect the data points. We can manage it going forward and train, but to them to pull off, stop what they're currently doing at all levels in order to populate the data to make a meaningful GIS. So. We're excited about where this is going. It's got some fine tuning. And the last part is a highlight of what you saw a meeting ago on the CIP, so I'm not going to go over that. We have a modest CIP coming up for the next year. 
That was not a budget workshop, correct? <laughs> number one? Because this is number one, the budget, budget workshop. It just felt It's like an it. element of... But that was that no, a budget discussion. That was, that was actually... See, I actually, uh, you know, we're going to have to renumber that. I'm going to give them credit. No, I, you're right. This is budget <laughs> workshop two. I thought you two. just left the number one as a placeholder nope, this for is all two. our meetings. This is two because you're right. We made <laughs> a change. <laughs> first one. Graham no, just I, wanted good, to go first. We will... Um, you're right, though. We did a, a change in our approach to try to get That's the CIP nice. ahead because you're right. We will be implementing basically year one of the CIP that you approved, sliding it in, and that's why it looks very familiar. The only other thing I um, do want to reflect, um, we have some notes about our funding structure, any sacred cows. We have made the note about um, dropping the application fee for the outdoor display of merchandise to 250 and just having that be a flat application fee and then obviously you already established what the annual fee will be so um, we'll be bringing Mayor, you have a point about that not about that fee I'm no sorry. I yeah. wanted to go back just, just a bit but go ahead and finish that um, and then as Kathleen mentioned we will be uh, bringing um, council policies directed that we bring back our annual master fee schedule uh, we do a CPI adjustment. We review certain things that may go either up or down based on known costs. Um, we don't anticipate a tremendous amount of change. Most of those will be CPI factors because we did spend so much time on the implementation and review last year. So with that, I think Kathleen and I are prepared to take any questions, and we certainly appreciate feedback and dialogue from the council uh, because staff is going to use this feedback and dialogue as we go back and really work for the next six weeks on putting this all together. <clears throat> Vice Mayor? Um, just to back up a little bit into page uh, five, I guess, where you talked about the, those three potential project expenditures. Well, I guess my first question is on the town facility security. <coughs> Do you look at that as a, a capital project or as a general fund investment project? <laughs> Well, it's going to end up being, the way we're trying to do it, it'll be a major CIP project, which okay. will be funded by our capital projects fund is the most likely. We may be able to get, the other thing we're also trying to look at, if there are certain elements that of the corporation yard that our recycled water project can pay for, we'll, we'll try and get some of those into that financing. So it's a variety. Okay. We've got a, a, a little itsy-bitsy part in the town hall remodel project but not fundamental. The first first one, uh, records management, I think we've included that in our general fund budget in the past with some of the stuff Contract we've done. Mm -hmm. And the same with GIS, I think that would go under the departmental budget. Um, my only response is all those things sound great. It's hard right now to see we've got the new lease revenue bonds coming in of the, how are those going to fit and where are we going to, where are they? <coughs> so I just, that's my only comment yeah. is they sound great, but if right. the money's not there, Correct. We'll and, deal with that. And I will also say our initial um, plugging, we can accomplish these, and that's, you know, if we have to scale back. The other thing is GIS will not stay at that level. Right, I understand. That will be a, uh, a significantly reduced cost once we get through the initial implementation, and hopefully the security will be a one-time expense and then Something not a significant expense going after. I don't know, Graham, you have any thoughts on those you want to share? No, that's about as well, my thought as well. Upfront yeah. costs, but long-term operating costs for maintaining the system would come out of salaries and consultant services and stuff. Okay. Any other questions from council on this last uh, little segment? I'm thinking the vice mayor. Do you want to go back to another? Or sorry, Councilmember Dorn Becker, do you have a question on this? I just this piece? I wasn't going to bring it up now, but I, I, can you ex explain to me again what GIS? what a GIS system means? <coughs> I'll try. Um, and I think I can probably. Um, GIS is geographical information system. So what we're really taking, what we're talking about is being able to take either information that uses a data point, uh, for example, your parcel. It could be oh, APN. But we also could do things, and this is where there's some real practical, like all of our streetlights. We can pull them up by location. Somebody calls in. We can manage them. Somebody knocks one okay. down. Thank so you. it's bringing it into a, a very specific geographical uh, structure. And it will, 
I mean, we're talking, it, it really will touch every department. Greatly modernizing mm -hmm. the data. Improving mm -hmm. staff efficiencies. Pipes, once we water get meters, all that. Yeah. Fire Vice, hydrants. There are maps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vice Mayor, you had another question or comment? Well, I, the, my only other comment was on the very last section. Um, your direction question to consider, yada, yada. Um, I, I feel like everything that you guys have said and your your understanding of what the general consensus is of the council is is very good, even if I don't always agree with it. But in, <laughs> but in general, I think you're always on the right track. Going through these, what you would say we would want, I, I generally agree with. Um, I think you guys you seem to always understand what this current council wants. To, to kind of go into Marita's comment a little earlier, um, <clears throat> and you were talking about the library and and how many people it affects is when you when you talk about what core services or what are the sacred cows etc. We always talk about you always talk about fireworks. I like fireworks. Um, is the way I always look at these, and I think if we get into the situation, which it doesn't sound like we have this year, is what things touch the most people, right? right. And and you know I, I think the after school program is a great example. A tremendously important service to the town. I can make very good arguments for why it helps the town and its culture, but it does touch fewer people than most, which is why we've gone after cost recovery on a bigger scale and have been very successful. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you, Carol, et cetera. Um, so, but when we look at things that we heavily subsidize, which is many, um, that's the way I look at it, is the same way that you enunciated that, which is let's make sure that we're affecting the most people possible. And we're doing a good job on that, and that's all. Well, and I think that's actually very helpful in setting the stage because right now staff's feeling, and it is that until we tighten up a few things, that, and I, I use that as a, a maintenance of effort budget. We basically believe that the revenue increases will allow us to keep our programs at the relevant level they're at, factoring in the cost. You know, materials and supplies go up. So if we want to maintain something at the same level, some of those budgets need to go up a little bit to accomplish that. Right now, um, I, I think we're going to be able to achieve the budget in a very similar format to what we did last year. But that's also why it's important to know that we're not adding a bunch of other stuff and that there's not an expectation from you all that we do that. Um, so I, I think from what I'm hearing, I appreciate that. That's what we need to know to, to go out and continue, I think, to put this together. Uh, and I would uh, extend that that thought to our fee structure, and we've talked about that. We are trying, and I think we've been very uh, collaborative about this, trying to make sure that we minimize the impact on our residents and continue to maximize the service we're giving our residents and you know, very fundamentally uh, charging more to uh, non-residents to participate in some things and I think that's been the mission we've had not eliminating any core services at all losing very few if any discretionary services and recreational programs um, and we're able to do it while continuing to fund things like OPEV continuing to fund things like uh, fund reserves mm -hmm. and so I think we're all very sensitive to the fact that we're in a very very positive situation but every time we have these conversations there is always you know one foot on the gas or on, one foot on the brake as, as well as the gas pedal that that we're not just going fast and and spending all the money right. without thinking about five years ten years down the road and you know the CIP is a perfect example of that that we have to keep adjusting that as necessary um, you know, we need to get to those capital projects. They're a lot. They're very expensive, so we can't we can't ignore them t um, until you know a line breaks or until there's you know some kind of disaster. So I think we've been very good. The staff's been very good about responding to our direction, even though our direction hasn't always been exactly straight. You know, we've got to keep you honest a little bit. Been good. Well, I I do have a question. A comment was made about a modest capital improvement program. If ten million dollars a year. This coming fiscal year is modest. What's aggressive? <laughs> Depends, Depends on who's paying for it. Good question. <laughs> Substantial capital improvement program. Okay. 
I, I do, I would like to oppose if, if you're done with all your well, comments I think maybe Councilmember Muller had one more comment. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, one thing that I routinely hear going around town is that Yonfil has lots of money. You know, and it, it's unfortunate that that perception is there. I mean, in a way, uh, you know, we're, it, it's not painful, it's but we really don't have this, you know, just extra money floating around that we really don't do anything with. I think that it really goes to the, the council and the staff and everybody that we spend a lot of time really managing uh, our finances and it re requires a lot of disciplines. I know we could all think of a lot of things, you know, we'd like to do, but I mean, I would really like to be able to get that message out to the, the public that, you know, we're, we're very, very disciplined in our approach to our, our finances and what we really try to do is, uh, set up our financial policies so they really, you know, meet with <coughs> consistently with the, the values that, you know, are shared by our residents. Uh, so um, if anybody's listening out there, it's not, we don't have a flood of money. We're, we're doing well, but we have to manage it I tightly. think that's an important message that all of us have to share when our opportunities when we're meeting and talking. And in fact, that's a comment that I, I use the phrase, Yountainville is financially stable we're disciplined, but we're not an ATM. And there is a perception. And I think some of that has to do with the nature of some of our businesses, but people have to understand that the town of Yountville as an organization, you know, we are, we are a, a, a different animal than some of those, but we are financially stable, um, you know, and to your point, the discipline and how we both go about doing that on the policy and the staff you know that's what keeps us in that position while we've built reserves um, so I do think that is a message and we'll continue to work on helping to do that and it's also important that our residents realize that you know when they talk about some of the things that they want or what they're getting or not getting for their tax dollars they need to remember that the, the amount of money that they really send us are limited to a couple a couple um, opportunities one they pay water and sewer rates and they pay property tax that we get a share. And then in some cases, there's some user fees if they have, are an application for planning or something, or if they use some of our park and rec charges. That's all. You know, we don't have parcel tax. We don't have a bunch of other user tax. Our business base rate, our business tax rate, nominal. Um, so it, it is important. I think you know we do have to we do have to get that message out. We're very fortunate in some ways, and we've been able to weather the storm, but your point is correct. It, it's, you know, there's not, um, you know, we aren't sitting on $20 million with nothing to do. If we were, you would tell us, right? <laughs> yes. I, I think you would For, tell us. Fortunately, actually. the accountants would tell us as well. <laughs> That's what we think. Kathleen, you had another Yes, I just comment. have a, actually a question for all of you, and this more has to do with our process. So our next budget workshop, number two, Three. will be in our regular, no, you're going to mess things up. Don't renumber <laughs> my stuff. So we'll be May 7th at our regular meeting, and we'll talk more about general fund overview. And then we have our two special budget workshops where we really review the departments. And for that... I personally, I love the paperless process, but I will be using a binder as I have in past years, and I just want to put the question to the council, if you all want a binder for the budget workshops, or if you want to have a full paperless budget process. And you know, you can get back to me or think about that, but I just want to. Yeah, let's, let's have uh, individual question. council respond by email to staff on that, so you that can would think be about fine. it. That would be fine. Electronically paperlessly or actually in person you feel free to speak to Kathleen on that you could write me a memo paperless paperless that's why in person oh, paperless okay. well but if anybody has a different feeling you, once you think depends. about it, it maybe a this, mix well, too I don't know you want a book I yeah. want a book I, I hear you <laughs> that's why I want to ask well I think I'd like um, the paper because I'll take it with me to Italy since I'm going to miss those meetings <laughs> <laughs> they might charge you extra in your luggage but I will give you a book I really don't think you want to carry that binder. Yeah, it sounds like the last thing I'd be carrying to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give you Richards when you get back. Okay. Well, if there's any, <laughs> okay. any, if you need any further, okay, nice. okay, guidance. Yes, I will confirm by email, but I, yeah, I think great. I've got it. Okay, are we are we finished with that item then? Yes. Thank great. you. Great. Thank you very much.
Okay, we are going to move on to our Parks and Community <coughs> Services Commission. We have two parts to this one. First one is considering adoption of the resolution to uh, amend the bylaws as stated. Um, let's start with the staff report on that item. Breaking things over here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So tonight I bring forward to you some um, revised bylaws from the Parks and Community Services Commission. So just a little background, the commission was com created in 2008 as a way to streamline uh, many citizen committees and groups that were providing information and recommendations to staff and the council. Uh, that included the Community Hall Commission, an informal senior advisory group, and a teen advisory group. So currently the PCSC consists of seven members serving staggered two-year terms and one high school non-voting member um, who serves uh, one-year terms while in high school. So that's a total of eight. So in December 4th of 2012, you approved the creation of the Onfield Arts Commission, which gave us the opportunity to conduct a comprehensive review of the PCSC bylaws uh, because we were needing to remove the reference to the arts in there because they have been transferred to the Arts Commission. So at that time, we talked about some of the history, and over the past four years, the commission has evolved, and the, in, the issues that are being brought forth aren't as robust in nature. Um, we don't have uh, park development going on really within the town limits. Um, we have one undeveloped parcel of park space. Um, and to really to save commissioner and staff time as well as streamline the important work of the commission, we are suggesting the following bylaw updates. And this was approved by the Parks and Community Services Commission on February 21st. So I'll just run through those quickly, and then there's also the track changes document that was included in your packet. So we suggested revising the commission name to better reflect the duties. Um, we recommended the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. It also aligns with the department. We removed reference to cultural arts as the formal Art Yountville Arts Commission has been established. We're suggesting reducing commission seats to six, which will be comprised of five members and one high school um, representative. That's because staff has found it difficult to recruit and retain the full eight members. And we've also had issues meeting the quorum on multiple occasions. <laughs> so if the council approves this change tonight, um, the following staff presentation and report from Michelle um, will be appointing two seats and one high school voting member. So if not approved, the council will appoint three seats, um, which actually should now be two. We had one withdraw, um, and then we would reopen the recruitment, recruitment. So we also revised the stipulation of residency based on the reduction of seats. Um, we also suggested... What do you mean by that? Oh. So when we um, dropped it from eight to six, we also revised the number of... Um, required residency seats because it would have still been six so everyone would have been a Yauntville resident okay. well, and currently we have still need to be a resident but not as many uh, people yeah the number just had to change so you still have to be a resident so there, there's no change uh, on, on there, no no that's what we're referring four, to actually four, I mean the number of required residents changes it's on page five of eight of the uh, so there actually has been an existing um, line in the bylaws where current, um, currently, before you change it, uh, we required five of the seven seats to be Yauntville residents. So not everyone has to be a Yauntville resident. They can be affiliated with a local Yauntville nonprofit or business. Um, so we are, we are now decreasing that from five to four seats, four of the six. Getting back up to my notes. Um, so we also are requesting to revise the frequency of the meetings to just the odd months of the year, so six months out of the year. Uh, this would allow for more robust agendas and ensure better use of the commissioner and staff time. Um, and that was actually a request of several commissioners. 
uh, stipulate, we would like to change the stipulation that the student representative doesn't vote. So currently it's a non-voting seat. Um, that was something that um, both the past chair and the chair brought up to me is it, it does create kind of an awkward environment when we're voting on items um, and also doesn't um, really put a lot of oomph behind that position. Um, and so I I did uh, scanning of other jurisdictions bylaws to see how they handled student representatives and it's pretty um, across the board that the student rep does vote. Some of them do a special vote and others just include it in the typical vote. Um, we also are changing the bylaws to reflect the Rosenberg's rules of order which is the town standard for commissions and also consistent with the town council's protocol. <coughs> so that would be an update. So before you tonight, I have the um, resolution to update bylaws. It would be uh, resolution 3096-13. And as I said, I've also included the track changes bylaw revisions as well. And I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from council? No questions. Uh, no public either. So uh, is there any action to be had on this item? I move that we approve resolution number 3096-13, amending Parks and Community Services Commission bylaws, including changing the name of the commission to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Totally makes sense. And I appreciate that you did that additional research to find out uh, how appropriate those bylaws are. So thank you very much for that. Next up, we have we still have some seats to fill. Yes, we do. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we originally record, uh, recruited back in December to fill the vacancies based on the original composition of the PCSE, and since then we delayed actual appointment pending consideration of changing the composition of this body. And as a result um, of our recruitment period, we had received four applications, um, one from Sandry. Sandy Fagan, one from Charlene Silva, one from Eric Knight, and one from Denning Defer, the high school advisory member. Um, today we received a request from Eric Knight to withdraw his application, and the result of that is we have the um, equal number of applicants for seats available tonight, which is two members and one high school representative. Um, before you this evening, um, we also provided updated application for Denning Defer. We also provided completed questionnaire for Char Charlene Silva, who was unable to attend tonight due to a pre prior commitment. And then also the letter uh, email request from Eric Knight withdrawing his application. So as a result of um, the applicant interviews tonight, council has unanimously voted to appoint all three members. And I ask that council take that action tonight to officially appoint if there are no further questions from council. And that would be to uh, appoint uh, Sandy Fagan and Charlene Silva and Denning DeFour yes. to the Parks and Community Services Advisory Commission. Yes. Do we need to change that language then in the? Yeah, I'll go ahead and change that. Those changes will be so that we can just do based as on a, the prior staff report. Should we say as amended if we're assuming we're going to do this or? To, need... to the newly named commission okay. is suitable, I think, would be fine. So is there any discussion or um, action to take on staff's recommendation? I think we've, we've already done it, so I'll we need to... I'll take a motion to approve the three candidates that were stated there. Second. second. Thank you. I think uh, it was Council Member Moeller seconded. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, thank you, you to all three of our... Um, Appointees. I also want to thank Eric Knight for his years. I believe it was three years. Was he on the commission? Since it's in, yes, since its inception. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't get to acknowledge him last week at our board commission and volunteer dinner, but we'll bring him to council to yes. acknowledge him here. So, yes, thank you very much to uh, Eric Knight for his service and also the ongoing commissioners. Um, excited to have a full, yes. full commission again. And uh, all of the applicants were very impressive, I will say. I think yeah, uh, nice across the board, we were very satisfied. Uh, sometimes we do deal with uh, what happens if there's somebody we feel maybe not be as skilled or knowledgeable when we have the same number of seats. Well, that wasn't a question at all today. And we were very comfortable with all three um, applicants. Okay, and thank you very much for handling that um, 
Moving on to staff informational reports. Do we have any? Yes, very briefly, the town hall's uh, structural strengthening project moves forward tonight. You took action to approve the purchase of the modular. Um, staff is working with the design team on some final layouts. We anticipate a charrette to bring to the ad hoc committee on what this layout's going to look like, and we're continuing to do some of the preliminary assessments. So uh, projects moving forward, they're developing. Uh, we've met and are working on understanding uh, the relocation of these meetings to the community center, what that's going to look like, how to televise them. Uh, there is one footnote that we are going to need to evaluate that we hadn't necessarily thought about, and it offers some opportunities. Um, but if you pardon my visual presentation, uh, this wall is going to come in about 8 to 10 inches, and it could have an impact on the dais, and it, it may allow us an opportunity to look at retransitioning because if the dais comes out and we need to have an ADA accessibility to the exit, so we, we may have to look at shifting or doing some modification of the dais, which wasn't initially intended, but could have some positive impacts depending on how we do it. So I just share with you that so far seems to be about the only thing that is really causing me a, a little bit, um, but that's just something to look at. Typical construction. <laughs> you didn't know that before you guys got those plans? It's a kidding, Steve. You have to wire us for electricity <coughs> now that we're Some electronic. Oh, that's a good point. Any other informational reports? Yes, I have one. Um, just want to update the council on our recycled water project. Um, again, local government is working more quickly than the state and federal government. Um, you approved the CEQA document in August, and the, we're hoping this month that the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation will, will approve and sign the finding of no significant impacts to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, we're also waiting on the state for a petition for change, which has to do with re recycled water going to the river. Usually it's related to people pulling water out of the river, but the state has taken jurisdiction to, to review this as well. Um, we have met with all of the existing and proposed recycled water customers. Um, we've asked them for a letter of intent, which we'll submit to the state as part of our state revolving loan fund grant um, loan application. Um, we've received one of those. We're still waiting on four. Um, at a future meeting, we will be um, bringing the memorandum of agreement with the what used to be called the Bay Area Recycled Water Coalition but is now the Western Recycled Water Coalition which has um, about five new agencies in the Central Valley have joined the coalition so it's expanding and could possibly go s to uh, other states in the next year or so uh, with Nevada I believe. Um, also we're working on the 90 percent design which we brought to the council in a few months to review um, so we go out to bid hopefully sometime about this time next year for construction in 2014. So just want to, we've made some progress, some milestones, just wanted to give you an update on what's happening with that, that significant project here in town. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, this expansion of the recycled uh, water district or something, is this going to be a good thing or is this just going to be like so big, is this going to be like more <laughs> bureaucratic and drive us more crazy? Well, what we've heard from this, uh, our federal Congress congressional representatives and senators is that they want the coalition to be bigger because it's a good thing because it helps to promote recycled water and also to get funding. I thought it was funding. mandated anyway. Um, the mandates are from the state to recycle more water and with this current project we're looking at increasing our recycling by 70 percent and during dry years recycling 100 percent. The state would like every agency to do that. Um, the federal government with the whole issue with um, the state water project, the Central Valley project, and water in the delta um, would like agencies to recycle more water. So by working together with these other agencies, they are able to go back to Washington, which they did last week, and talk to our representatives, talk to federal agencies, staff, and to promote funding or financing of recycled water projects. So with sequestration, it makes it difficult, but if funding does become available through the Title 16 program, the idea is that this coalition will be more competitive than a coalition from Texas or Ohio or Florida or other places. So it's, it's, um, it's, it appears that working with more groups and larger numbers is more advantageous for those agencies. Okay, thanks. Any other? Yes, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, two more items. We are going to officially open the recruitment for the Yauntville Arts Commission, hopefully tomorrow. So keep a lookout for um, brochures and um, the 
notice of vacancy posting on our website and also we are currently recruiting for one member on the zoning and design review board we have not received applications to date so if anyone is interested please apply see our website this is to fill an unexpired term for Rob Anglin and the upcoming three-year term which is uh, a group is due to expire in July of 2013 so we'll be doing another recruitment in a few months and is that uh, vacant seat just until that July no, I've added into this notice to fill it for the additional term so they don't just serve three months and have to reapply. Great. Any other staff reports? No? Okay, council meeting reports. We'll start with uh, Napa County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. I was um, I attended a meeting, uh, Napa Mayor Jill Teckel, Supervisor Bill Dodd, and two staff members are uh, once again, going to Washington, D.C. to lobby for flood control funding. As, our, uh, as Graham just mentioned, that funding source <coughs> remains challenging, but they're going to continue to do their due diligence on that. Also, the uh, flood bypass design is expected to be complete by, Jul by July of this year with construction bids going out in September. There are years of work done and some significant accomplishment shown, especially this last December, but uh, mm -hmm. that's a reminder there's still quite a bit of uh, substantial work left to do on that project. Let's see. Napa County Transportation and Planning Agency. Uh, I'll start, and if the Vice Mayor has any follow-up. There was a ribbon-cutting ceremony that we attended that formally opened the Sosco Gateway Transit Center. Congressman Mike Thompson was there uh, offering remarks and uh, representatives from the, I think it was the Federal Transportation Commission and another regional agency. Was it MTC? I think it was MTC, Metropolitan Transportation okay. Commission, um, with a, a formal ribbon cutting. Uh, also, it came to the board's attention that the restrooms, the public restrooms had been closed uh, due to vandalism and theft virtually since they opened a few months ago. Uh, the board decision was to reopen those and hopefully through interaction with local law enforcement and, and other concerns, a, concerned agencies will figure out how to mitigate the, the uh, trouble they've been having down there. Um, also, uh, more uh, close to home, we officially appointed Joe Tagliabashi as our active transportation advisory com committee representative and also there's an ongoing conversation about the professional legal services contract that's uh, currently under review there is a d discrepancy in the the vote so that's apparently going to have to be brought back to the board um, there was some confusion during that whole um, fairly lengthy debate and so that continues any other comments about that uh no i think the only thing i was thinking about was uh when the new transit center opened in december i believe there's public restrooms there and they were open for five days before they were so thoroughly trashed <laughs> that uh, they had to be closed which first of all is shocking and second of all i guess gives us a little bit of understanding of how fortunate we are here in this community um and uh i th i think that uh i think they're on the right route to not punishing the 99% who are doing what they should be, but trying to figure out how to solve the problem. Because um, if you do take the bus from here all the way down to thinking, thinking you're going to BART, being told, sorry, there's no restrooms at our new $12 million transit facility doesn't sound that great. So that's bad customer service. So they're working on that. And there was also a re request by the board to review the voting structure that's been in place. That's an excellent point. Yeah. You can the, go ahead and touch the, on that. the voting structure of NCTPA is very unique. We're going to put it that way. There are, are, are members from all the jurisdictions, um, but we do not have equal weight, which is reasonable. Um, but uh, the kind of a legacy uh, of it is, is every member on the um, on the board has one vote, unless you're from the county and you have two votes, unless you're from the city of Napa and you have a total of ten votes between those two members. So essentially, two members from the city of Napa and one member from the county can veto everything else. And this gets into the vote counting issue that we... It was based on population, but it was done yes. many years ago. And, it, and one of the things that the city of Napa is 
even more skewed my understanding on the history is back uh, back when NCTPA was, NCTPA was created, the bus system was essentially the city of Napa, and they contributed most of the infrastructure and capital and et cetera, so they were given a little more weight than normal. Um, but there's certainly interest if you think that 20% of the county now lives in American Canyon and they get two votes out of uh, 22, I think we determined. You know, there's probably some that, – that would take a change of the JPA. So that is an issue that will probably be discussed over many months. All right. Okay, Napa River Watershed Conservancy Watershed Information Center. No, report. we didn't. No report? No report. All right. I have a report. Okay. Councilmember Hall has a report. I do. I uh, was fortunate enough on Valentine's Day to go to the Napa Valley Youth Gang Violence Commission <laughs> in Calistoga. Um, actually, it was a fairly well-attended meeting, mm -hmm. as you uh, might imagine. Um, there's a, it's a big commission, so there's a lot of commissioners. Um, there's also a lot of people from the public. Um, I think probably the principal takeaway, well, there's three I'll, I'll mention. The principal one um, is that there's a master development report committee that's out there doing um, some resource sort of collection analysis on, uh, you know, what services are available or what organizations are available to provide services to people who are um, potentially at risk for uh, gang violence or, or youth violence. And that, that goes as far as even um, uh, bullying in, in elementary schools, frankly. And that's something that I think is an important part of of understanding this isn't just about people who are wearing the colors, it's about kids in school that are taking and, and acting in, in this uh, manner. So there's a collection of the resources and, and that information will soon soon be available and the, the I believe they'll be publishing a report and putting it on their website. So there's information for families who have these issues that or, or have children or have family, other family members that may be involved or have issues around this. And so hopefully that information, um, they said mid-May was the deadline for the draft report of that. Um, a second item that came up, and I left uh, information with the town manager. It was it was an interesting presentation in the public comment period, where an individual um, who works for a group called My the My Levin program, um, and I won't even try to spell it or explain it, other than to say that what this group does is they come in and they do free tutoring in. Um, uh, what we'd call what we would consider public housing or low income housing. This is a program that is free, that is already being offered throughout Napa County um, and through other uh, six other um, counties or visitor centers, is what they present. And I left information with the town manager, and I don't know if we could reach out to Napa Valley Youth Housing Authority or the Napa Valley, I forget the housing authority. What's it called? Someone will help me. But that said, um, and providing them that essential information, um, specifically as it relates to the Yauntville um, Royal Grande housing that we have here, there's potential opportunity for free tutoring for s children that live in that, in, in that community. And so it's something that we should at least put on the radar screen. Um, and then the last thing which I found was most uh, unfortunate in the commission is that they have these commission meetings in the four um, communities or, in, or cities in Napa Valley. And I made it very clear that uh, Yauntville obviously, although this isn't a an enormous issue with our particular community with uh, youth and gang violence that we certainly also would be very interested in hosting one of these uh, committee meetings and so um, I did that I did put that forward to the um, uh, uh, what would you call it, the commission chair committee chair and um, hopefully we'll be getting some feedback in the not distant future about that so I don't know whether that would fall under your purview Sam if they were to do that at the uh, community center or one of the facilities or if we were actually to do it here in council chambers but yeah, um, I offered like that they could reach out to, to the cap to the town and we could website. coordinate something Trying like that so um, yeah there's a lot of good work going on and you know this this is the kind of stuff that we read about in a lot of other communities and not our own um, but it's certainly something that you know does travel and so we need to be cognizant of it and uh, at least participatory where we can be great thank you for that report any other meeting reports any other comments vice mayor I just want to draw attention to two upcoming fundraisers for Yonville Elementary School that are hosted by the uh, PTA. Um, typically the PTA's main fundraiser, fundraiser each year has been the red and white and uh, this year is the 20th anniversary of that and has essentially been split into two events. Um, the first event is on March 16th and it's at the Barrel Room uh, at the Vintage Estate. 
Um, and that is a uh, full dinner and uh, higher priced event. Um, and it is after the Taste of Yonville, um, just to clarify that. And then on April 6th, there is a, um, an event that is occurring at Silverado Vineyards, um, um, which is the traditional host of uh, the fundraiser. It will be $25 per person, and they will have a lot of the silent auction items and the more family-focused items. And the intent there is uh, to create a, um, I'm going to call it a more price-accessible event because uh, in, the, in the past uh, the tickets have been $100 or more, and that prices a lot of parents <clears throat> out of supporting their own school. So that's kind of the reason they've done a two-tier event. So March 16th and April the 6th. Yes, I was going to mention um, the March 16th event, so I'm glad you uh, reminded us about that second one. And just a reminder also, the Taste of Yonville, March 15th and 16th, with the street fair component being the 16th from, I believe, noon to 5. Uh, I have a couple other things, but I'll invite others. Anyone else have any other Councilmember Dornbacker comments? Well, I just wanted to report on the um, Napa Valley Marathon, which took place over last weekend. And a couple of really interesting things happened during the uh, marathon. One is that this year the theme was honoring women in marathoning, and they had the pioneers of women in running at the event, and they did a great panel discussion. Um, their names are Nina Kuchik, Joan Benoit Samuelson, uh, Lorraine Moeller, and Jackie Hansen. And uh, Nina Kuchik was... Um, the original woman who was so amazed that women could not run in the Boston Marathon that she ran along the pavement and uh, in protest and started the whole movement. So it was very inspiring to hear these women talk about, and that was in the 70s, so it's not like it was so long ago. Um, and then secondly, I received a word that there was a runner coming from Moscow who was the head of the uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters Association of Moscow. And so I contacted the Napa uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters and I introduced them and it was a really wonderful meeting and they're going to um, you know, collaborate and stay in touch by email. And uh, one of their donors was there and reached out. Um, he's a vintner and he's donating wine to the Moscow um, uh, ch uh, chapter of the Big Brothers Big Sisters for their fundraising event. So it was all very wonderful besides the fact that it was a beautiful day. We had 2,600 runners and um, everybody said it was just the best ever. And um, Council Member um, Lewis Chilton and his wife both ran the 5K. I have and can I follow up on that real quick? You, you're going to try to Tell us which one of you won that between uh, you and your wife. No, I'm not. Okay, I good want idea. to make a special congratulations to Yonville resident Hank Fragoza, who is 83 years old oh, and ran right. the 5K and beat both myself and my wife. Um, but he uh, he's around a lot and he runs in all kinds of events and it's. Uh, pretty amazing to be sitting there and chugging along and wheezing and then you see uh, the 83 year old up there take, taking you to school so congratulations once again Hank thank you Councilmember Hall yes I just have two um, hopefully all are aware and if not you will be after this we have a focus member dinner on March the 12th at the barrel room I believe that's at 6 p.m. $25 is uh, the entry fee, but it's for focus members. So if you're not a member, you can join. Um, and if you uh, haven't decided to come yet, you should decide to come. Um, and then the second, and maybe equally as important, again, it seems like Council Member Chilton's getting his recognition today. Um, I think this community has been well served by having a uh, very food friendly and price friendly, accessible. Uh, location in the Yonville Deli, which is celebrating its five-year anniversary. And so if you missed the $5 deal, Lewis is going to be extending that, um, but he hasn't really expressed <laughs> when that's going to be. It's going to be in five years. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> congratulations to the deli. Thank you. It's going to be $10 sandwiches. Yeah. Before I give my last two, I'm going to give a heads up to our town manager in case he wanted to mention the uh, Kiwanis cleanup uh, effort. Uh, you'd be 
If not, um, I will just share that the Altville Kiwanis Club members, uh, a number of us, worked on Saturday morning, and there was a cleanup along Yountville Crossroad from here to Silverado and back. Okay. And the volume of trash was surprisingly disappointing. I mean, it, there's more than you would think there should be. Mm. The good news is we are seeing a, a con continuation of the decrease in, um, you know, cups, cans, and stuff like that, but still the volume seems disturbingly large. But thanks to all our uh, local Yonville Kiwanis club members for doing that. I wanted to make sure we recognize them. The last two things I had, uh, just to remind folks that uh, in particular live in Washington Park, uh, as we discussed our last council meeting, uh, staff and I are continuing to have conversations about um, options to look at for the uh, ADA accessibility and uh, uh, curb cut project that we're uh, having ongoing discussions and uh, moving forward with that. The last uh, event coming up I wanted to mention, the Napa Valley Performing Arts Center at Lincoln Theater is holding their grand opening on March 23rd, which should be a wonderful event showcasing, again, their very strong uh, community uh, performing arts collaboration. They have a number of uh, very fine local community groups that are going to be performing along with some other folks, uh, some really, really um, strong support from the vintners as well as uh, some local chefs so again as we tend to do uh, put on a very good uh, show for uh, a very good local cause so a full march calendar it sounds like and that doesn't even get into ncaa basketball <laughs> uh, if that does it for council comments uh the future agenda item i see is our as our town clerk mentioned we have the zoning and design review board application uh, opening we have hopefully we'll have an interview or two to have for that position um, and with that uh, is there any need for closed session this evening I see we don't have any listed so I assume That's we don't right. <laughs> uh, with that I entertain a motion for adjournment to our next meeting which is Tuesday March 19th at 6 p.m. so moved second all in favor aye, aye. aye. thanks very much good night everyone